Look for it only in books, for it is no more than a dream remembered. Welcome back to the Essential Films Podcast, a podcast devoted to the discussion of the greatest movies ever made, or the Essential Films. I'm joined by my co-host, Senor Mark Espinosa. How are you doing today? How are you doing, my friend? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, This is going to be an epic episode, as we look into uh, one of the most epic films of all time. Uh, Last time we talked about Halloween, uh, the 1978 horror classic, and on this episode we're going to take pretty much the complete opposite direction and talk about uh, what many people consider, what a lot of people consider um, one of the greatest uh, films of all time, uh, Gone with the Wind. Oh, yes. We can talk about those damn Yankees. <laughs> now, Gone with the Wind, it's, it's an interesting film, um, before we get into too many of the details here, because it's, you know, and we can get into it a little later, but it's a film that has been accused of glorifying the South, the pre-Civil War South. Uh, <laughs> and you can certainly, um, there, there's certainly criticism to be made there. Uh, there, there's, there is a point in the film where, for example, uh, there is clearly a, a Ku Klux Klan raid, but they don't mention the name Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> that uh, is but correct. But that's clearly that's that's probably what it is. Um, but so so we 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 understand that there is that there's a lot of controversy and criticism to be made about this film along racial lines. Um, I'm not sure about you, but I'm not necessarily interested in in having that discussion on this show today. I'm more interested in discussing the film uh, on an artistic, on its artistic merits and its historical merit. I absolutely agree with you because the story behind this film is probably just as epic and long as the movie itself. So we have plenty of of meat to chew on when it comes to the backstage of this one. Absolutely. Um, So Gone with the Wind. Uh, was first released in December 15th of 1939, so it's coming up on its, oh geez, it's, uh, what is that, 70th, 80th anniversary, something like that? Uh, uh, I think it's 80th anniversary be, It's gonna coming up on 80th in yeah. a couple of years. Uh, so, but it's December 15th, so it's right now it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a 77th anniversary, something like that. Correct. Um, uh, <clears> it <throat> was directed by Victor Fleming, who... In 1939, also directed or was involved in another major production that year, uh, also released by MGM, The Wizard of Oz, uh, which we'll get to at some point on this show as well. Um, And also uh, famously produced by David O. Selznick, uh, with a screenplay uh, based on uh, the book Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. And it starred Clark Gable, Vivian Lee, Leslie Howard, Olivia de Havilland, amongst a cast of hundreds. Uh, It was a... An enormous success, critically, financially, and in the awards in the awards category, as it won uh, ten Academy Awards, nominated for more than that. Uh, some of the big ones it won, obviously, it won Best Picture, it won Best mm-hmm. Actress for uh, Vivian Lee, uh, it won Best Supporting Role for uh, uh, sorry, Best Supporting Actress for Hattie McDaniel, the first African American ever to win an Oscar, um, and uh, Best Director, Cinematography, Writing, and a, and a host of others. Uh, Clark Gable was nominated for um, for best uh, for best actor in a lead role, didn't win. And Olivia De Havilland was also nominated for supporting actress, but did not win. She lost out to uh, her co-star Hattie McDaniel. Uh, so, but other than that, it was one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest successes at the box office. I think uh, up until this point, I may be wrong. Some historian might be able to correct me. It was one of the first movies to sweep the Oscars, winning in in in, in a lot of categories like that. Uh, yeah, that's actually true, and uh, they made a made it a point to say that um, there was there wasn't a sweep like this until Titanic came along. So, like, it had like that record of like for sixty years of like being like the most winningest film at the Oscars. Yeah, um, and uh, Titanic, another historical romantic epic, actually, interestingly enough. There um, you go. So that so, gets a lot of shit wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that gets a lot of stuff wrong. I apologize. The audience. See, now you, now you have listening. to make me bust out the bleep button and editing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is one. It is a highly regarded film. Now, in in the years, um, in the years that that followed, uh, 
you know, so a lot of our, our people in our parents' generation or grandparents' generation consider this one of the greatest films. Um, then, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when, when more like film scholars and, and film students were, were more of a thing, it, it kind of dropped in, in, its, um, in its esteem, I, I, should I say, because more, most people, while um, most of these critics, while uh, agreeing that it was a very um, impressive production, did not uh, agree with it being a very good story or a very good piece of artistic fiction. Uh, but, you know, and then it, it's kind of wavered back and forth. And then after that generation, more people came back and rediscovered it and said, no, this is a great film. And then we go back and then we get some of the more uh, historians that looked at it from a racial perspective. And then we had that whole mess. So <laughs> it, it, it's a movie that, while it is considered a great film, uh, it's kind of been, it's kind of wavered from that spot. Uh, depending on who you talk to, and depending what year it is, and depending what year it is, that's true. Uh, but that that said, it does have, hold an, a a very important part in history. Uh, as I said, uh, it is it won it, it historically won all those Academy Awards. Uh, it, it is um, regularly featured in American Film Institute lists, and it uh, it was it's pre- being it's preserved in the United States Library of Congress. So it's it's a very important film as far as many people are concerned. Um, it's also um, the biggest movie of all time, adjust, if you adjust its, its uh, box office gross for inflation, it, there, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Avatar or uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens, neither one of those films has, can touch the massive success that Con with the Wind is. Uh, adjusted for inflation, the film and domestic tickets alone has made $1.7 billion. And if you take in the worldwide gross, it adjusted for inflation in 2016 dollars, it's at $4 billion. I don't think that anyone's ever going to touch that. I think it's it's going to be, it's going to forever hold that record. Well, frankly, it's awful. I don't give a damn about that. <laughs> okay. Actually, no, I take that back. I do. That, that's, that's pretty big. Uh, it, it, I mean, because even, even if you say, even let's say even, because, uh, you know, Avatar, Star Wars, Titanic, those movies made over a billion dollars. They're, they're closer to two billion. Um, but, you know, they made those th- those numbers in the 90s and the 2000s. And now a movie's making a billion dollars. While it's still not super common, it's more common than it was, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, it's not, it's not anything really – like if, you, if it makes it, like you're, you're, you're happy for it. But it's not some, like, untouchable rung of success anymore. Like it's right. – you, there could, is, you could easily – not easily, but you could get there now. Yeah. There, and it's, it's not so much of a shock. There is like a quote-unquote billion-dollar club. It has about 20 movies in it, um, most of them you know, big sci-fi action films. But uh, it, 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 there is a billion-dollar a billion club. Now, it's it, – it, again, I think in like 10, 15 years, it's going to be much more common. So you might eventually see a movie get up to the $4 billion mark. But then, if you just for inflation again, then Garden with the Wind will probably be at the eight billion mark. You know, so it, I don't think anybody will ever touch those numbers. I think it will. Yeah, but that, that, that that'll be during the time when movie tickets are like fifty bucks. Yeah, exactly. So that, exactly. You know, yeah, and then two billion dollars will be the the rung, and then yeah, three billion dollars. Exactly. Exactly. And the other thing is that yeah, that's the other thing you have to take consideration is that um, Gone with the Wind came out when you know there was no there was no home media or anything. It was. You only had one chance to see it, and that was at the movie theater. And it was a very popular movie, and you had to go see it. You only had one shot, and the only other time you got to see it is if it came back around in, in, a, in a re-release. So, you, in fact, it wouldn't even come on TV until the 1970s. So there was no other chance to see it. So it, back then, people couldn't just wait for video. They had to, they had to see it when it you was. Got, you had to hope that they would re-release it in theaters. You just had to hope if you wanted to see it again. Um, <clears throat> so... When did you first experience uh, the film Gone with the Wind? Oof! Oh, this is uh, this is a bit, a little bit of embarrassing. I don't want to, I don't want to mess up my street cred here, but this is fairly recent because I've seen, I've never seen the whole film in one sitting until about maybe like five years ago. I've always, I'd always sit through bits and pieces and then not watch the rest of it. It wasn't until. I bought my mother actually for uh, when the 70th anniversary Blu-ray. I think it was first time it was on Blu-ray. When that whole set came out, I actually bought that for her as a birthday gift because I knew that's one of her favorite movies, Gone with the Wind. And I bought her that Blu-ray set, the whole the box set with all like the the extra stuff, the book or whatever the hell it came with. 
And, you know, she said, you know, you're going to sit, you're going to watch this with me for once. And so we did. We watched it together. Sat through all four hours of it. And that was the first time I saw it. And I was completely, completely blown away by it. And I knew it, it was at that moment when I knew I understood, I should say, the uh, why it has such a great reputation because it's just it, 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 it's it's you could talk about the time period. You can talk about how it's portrayed nowadays, you know, in 2016, you know, almost 2017. But there's just something that's still timeless about it and something that's still like kind of it, it, you know, it's just your just traditional romance. It's just, you know, and then it's you're. It's just su- such a great film, very well structured. We'll get to more of that a little bit, but you know, I just I, I fell in love with the film that day. So uh, it, 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 I'm 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 not going to uh, uh, give you any any um, any flack for having seen it so recently because I'm actually in the same boat. Uh, I wor- first watched this film, I would say six or seven years ago for the first time. Unlike you, I had never seen bits or pieces of it. I knew, of course, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I knew uh, all the famous lines. Um, but even as someone who had been who had been a big cinephile and who had been, um, you know, had seen so many movies at that point, uh, I was working my way through at that point uh, through all the uh, movies on the IMDb Top 250. That was like my little, a little goal of mine that I tried to, to – and, and every time, you know, Gone with the Wind was closer to the top. And I, and I just knew its reputation of being a long movie, and I just didn't want to sit through it. I was just like, I don't want to sit through four hours of a movie, right? So Because, see, the, the thing is, too, is like <laughs> when it comes to these long movies, bro, and I'm sure a lot of people will agree with us. When, when you have these long four-hour movies, it's like you have to set aside like an entire day to watch it, you know? For example, Lord of the Rings, the extended cut of any one of those films, you have to literally set aside like an entire day to just sit and watch it. The Watchmen Ultimate Cut is like four and a half hours. You literally have to set aside a whole day to watch it. You know, these long films, that's the thing. Like, And then you don't, you don't have time you, to set aside an entire day to watch a movie. You know, that's that's why, like, when, you, when it comes to those, not that you want to watch it, but it's just, it feels like a chore because you have to set aside all that time for it. Right. Uh, I think, I honestly, interestingly enough, I would if even though I own the Blu-ray and I can watch it in the com- in the comfort of my own home, if if for example there was like a revival theater that was playing it, I would much rather go to see it in the theater, be and pay and pay to see it because then it's like at least you're going out to do something and yeah it's exactly. four hours but it's like there's gonna be an intermission you know and there's like you know you can buy popcorn and like it'd be much more of an experience than like sit it just feels almost like homework to sit and watch this movie you know <laughs> exactly so, so i i kind of like and then finally it was getting to the point where i was i had seen most of the movies on the imdb 250 and i was like all right fine i'll, I'll get gone with the wind um and i remember having issues getting it um for whatever reason it was like um because I, I had netflix at the time i was trying to get it through netflix and I, there was some problem with the disc sh- uh shipping or something oh here's what it was it was I got the disc, but it was scratched, so it wasn't playable. Oof! And I've had uh, a few of those in my lifetime. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I, I so I had to like you know, and then I had already committed to watching it. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna go and rent it. And I went to Blockbuster when they were still around. <laughs> uh, I went to Blockbuster, and I why I, are you supp- why are you supporting corporate America? <laughs> well, it was clo- it was closer to my apartment at the time. So oh, okay. I went to Blockbuster and I and I walked around and I I was looking and I was like there were no movies older than like the year two thousand at that Blockbuster. I was like, where? How do you not have the Gone with the Wind not here? And I asked for it and like the college student sitting behind the desk was like, I, I don't know what that is. So they didn't oh. have it at Blockbuster. <laughs> so I had to like I'm red, my friend. I'm I, I had red. to like go to. Um, a local, like another local video shop. It was like an actual local place. They didn't have it on DVD. They had like the double VHS set to rent. Um, so oh, I was like, Ben Hur. I, I had the Ben Hur <laughs> set for that. The Titanic set for that. Thank, Good old was, VHS. So I, I finally, I, I watched the movie that way. And finally, and after sitting, and I, luckily I still had a VCR, and, and I sat and I watched it, and I was like, oh, this is actually good. This is actually a really good movie. I shouldn't have waited so long to watch it. Now, it, it, 
you know, we are recording this a little later than we intended to. We intended to record this in November. It's obviously December, as you're hearing this episode now. Uh, we had some scheduling difficulties uh, in order to get this episode even recorded. Uh, and some... Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, we just had to find the time to actually watch the movie. Uh, because, as we said, it's a four-hour movie. It's a four-hour movie. <laughs> and, then, and then we had to find time to actually talk about it. So this episode might go a little long. I'm going to try to keep it as efficient and, and clean as possible. But, um, but that, that's when I saw it. Even though I am a cinephile and I've watched, you know, I had watched so many movies at that point, I had actually let Gone with the Wind uh, kind of slide, and I finally only watched it like five or six years ago. So that is my shame as well. But you know what? At least we're in the same boat. Exactly. And then the thing is about the movie as well that the uh, times when I would – like I admittedly only saw like bits and pieces of the film, ironically enough, would be at uh, during history classes in school. They would like show like the, the burning of Atlanta, you know, the sh- – Talking about you know the Civil War, we talk about Sherman's March to the Sea. They would always do the Battle of Atlanta. They play it, that seemed like the go-to for a lot of his, the teachers when they were teaching the Civil War, you know, at least in the nineties. Like they would go to Gone with the Wind. They would show like the burning of Atlanta. They'd show like the beginning with the on the plantation, you know, and then they would kind of go off of that to teach start teaching the Civil War. So I don't that in my experience in my youth. That would be like the times I would see like the – just the snippets of Gone with the Wind when my teacher would put on a clip of Gone with the Wind for history class when we learned the Civil War. So there you go. <laughs> Nowadays, I you know, you, you, you try to pull that. They're going to say, well, why would the slaves be happy that they're slaves? You know, and why would – you know, so like you, you'd start – you start getting all of that back talk. So like back in the 90s, you didn't really have that yet. See, you're lucky you got gone with the wind. My when we were learning about the Civil War, the movie that we had to watch was Gettysburg, and man, that movie. I'm sorry, that movie's terrible. Like, oh, I know, Glory's another one. Glory's, Glory's, another Glory's one a good we... movie. Gettysburg yeah. is not a good movie. <laughs> now, Gettysburg has a. From what I remember, Gettysburg has actually a great musical score, but it is a boring movie. Even and and I know I was 13 or 14 at the time that I saw it, and I get it. But honestly, I it, it's it's just dull and dry and. It is not a good film. It does not hold up, and that's what we had to watch. So, um, so at least you got gone with the wind. Well, I, I guess the post eighty sevens now get a Lincoln as their uh, go to for the Civil War. Yeah, they'll probably get they'll probably get Lincoln. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> the millennials. <laughs> um, so, uh, as we as we mentioned earlier, Gone with the Wind was based on a novel by uh, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, Gone with the Wind was a, a very popular, best-selling uh, novel. Uh, it was chopped around to different um, Hollywood kind of studios before it even published, I think. Uh, and most of them turned it down. MGM turned it down. RKO turned it down. Um, uh, Warner Brothers turned it down. Uh, I think they were going to do it, but uh, Betty Davis, uh, who was going to be, who would have been Scarlett O'Hara, said she didn't want to do it. So then, they, so then Warner Brothers turned it down. So I think every studio turned it down. Um, so what's interesting though, is that even though this is considered an MGM movie, it was actually not produced by MGM. It was distributed by MGM. Distributed. Uh, Correct. and was actually produced by David O. Selznick, uh, who had a, an independent production company called Sel- Selznick International Pictures. And he bought the rights, uh, to Gone with the Wind. And I believe Selznick International is, uh, this was their only movie, if I'm not mistaken. I think this is the only movie he actually produced or if it wasn't the only movie it, he only did a few because yeah, basically, yeah about a handful he only did a handful right because this he this basically took up all his money um so uh but it, and it's ironic because this is one of the most successful movies of all time um so eventually so he did produce it and then mgm did agree to distribute it so uh that that's kind of the production background of it i don't know if you have any more info on that well here's the interesting thing about about this um the the bids to buy this novel were started even before the novel was released. So I can kind right. of understand the hesitation from like these studio heads. They're like, okay, this novel hasn't even come out yet. We don't know if it's gonna be good, how it's gonna be received. So we don't wanna like commit to having to make this novel into a movie, you know, if the novel sucks, essentially. Right. So um but uh Selznick kind of took a chance and said, you know, it, it, I think he he bought the rights. I think about maybe a couple weeks before the novel was released. So you know he was having his reservations, but you know 
he he figured, you know what? Actually, you know, it might have been actually, it might have been like maybe a week or two weeks after it came out because it was recommended to him by like his story editor, Kay Brown, who's mentioned a lot by the way in the documentary that I saw, which is called Making of a Legend, which is a very famous documentary about Gone with the Wind that came out in 1988. Um, I think it was about a couple weeks after the book was released, and uh, his story editor, Kay Brown, recommended him saying, "You got to buy this book." Um, there was still no not much buzz around it because the book had just come out, so. He plunked down the 50000 he got the rights, and then the novel became this huge success that like everyone was reading. And we're, as we're going to get to in a little bit, the the American public, as they're reading the book, they only had – it, it seemed like at least they kind of – I get I think they're romanticizing it a little bit. But the way they're making it seem like the um, everybody, the American public, the American reading public who had Gone with the Wind, who were reading Gone with the Wind, had only one Red Butler in mind, and that was Clark Gable. Yeah, I mean, but Clark Gable was also the biggest movie star in the world at the time. So it, it, it kind of makes sense, you know? Well, I'm sure it does. I'm just saying, like, you know, the way they kind of portrayed it, it was like, you know, everybody wanted Clark Gable. When you had, like, Gary Cooper, you had Errol Flynn, you had guys like that that really could have also kind of filled those shoes. It's spe- speaking of Gary Cooper, he was considered for the part, and he turned it down, uh, thinking that the movie was going to be a flop. So... <laughs> I love Gary Poop Pooper, but well, not, hindsight is twenty twenty. So. I love Gary Cooper, but not the smartest, uh, not the smartest decision in his part. Although that, honestly, like I, I have no, I've never read the book. I, I, I don't know the 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 character of Brett Butler as as in literary form. I just know him in 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 filmic form, and nobody else could have played that role. It had to be. Oh, uh, I agree. And the thing with Cooper too was that I mean, Selznick did consider Cooper when. You know, he had a there was a chance that he wasn't being able to get Gable, but Goldwyn Samuel Goldwyn wasn't going to lend him out anyway. So it was, I think it was after that that Cooper said he wasn't interested because even he kind of succumbed to the fact. Okay, Gable is Rhett Butler. Like there could be nobody else. But Gable, I believe, was also under contract to MGM anyway. Uh, so he al- they correct. also had to do some sort of finagling to get him to, exactly to, yes. to get him to appear, which I think delayed production even like more than it was supposed to so like this this this, it's one of those movies that like has such a a, a production history that it's it's that you would think that if you if if it was like 2016 that this movie is being made and you're reading all this stuff in variety and deadline and all that stuff you would think oh man this movie's gonna tank look at all the problems it has because it's just it it, it Uh seemed like it was such a, a money pit um sells next folly it was called yeah and then uh boy again it became the biggest movie of all time so I, I, watching that documentary like the, the as soon as and i'm hearing all these things and how like the press like had a hopper and all those bitches are like kind of like week after week kind of like putting sales down about what's going on with the picture um it kind of harkened me back to when i was learning about apocalypse now and and that kind of clusterfuck you know so, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, like two shades of the same curtain, you know? Now, would that be a curtain you make dresses out of? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so, so it was a very difficult production. Um, it took it took many years to, to actually get off the ground, and when they finally and they finally uh, started production. I think it took like almost a year to, to film. I think it took like eight or nine months to film. So it was it was a very lengthy pre production, very lengthy production. Um, uh, but you know, it, it eventually obviously came out, and and history was made. Um, this also, in, in addition to some of the other problems, it it, it also had, interestingly enough. Uh, it's it's nineteen thirty. It's other nineteen thirty nine counterpart released by MGM, The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> had the same kind of production problems in the sense that it kept changing directors and it shared two of the same directors. Um, originally, the film was being directed by George Cukor, who was fired, um, and then George Cukor was also on The Wizard of Oz and was fired from that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it uh, then it went to Sam Wood briefly uh and then it went to finally victor fleming felt fleming by the way was also fired from i'm sorry he wasn't fired he he was also took over from the fired george cuker on the wizard of oz so it, it, it's it's kind of 
it, it's kind of a, a big old mess of, 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 of people yeah, what, interchanging. What kind, of, what kind of studio is Louis B. May running over there? I know, right? Uh, so the but it, so Victor Fleming now Victor Fleming takes cre- on screen credit for both of those films, but again, if you watch either film. You will still see scenes uh, directed by George Cukor. In Wizard of Oz's case, you're going to see scenes uh, uh, directed by Mervyn Leroy and King Vidor. Um, but so you, they're still there. Some of those scenes are still there. But the on-screen credit uh, of the official director is is um, is uh, Victor Fleming for both of those films. Now, it's what I find interesting is um, I wonder. In today's day and age, with like the Directors Guild and everything like that, Oof. how they would how would they would get around that? Because if you've ever noticed, like some of those big, the, some of the bigger epic movies, uh, whether it's like a superhero movie or or you know a uh, a big Oscar kind of uh, movie, and if you look at the the screenplay and the story by credits, it's like ten people or something because the mm-hmm. script has been passed around and everyone has to get credit for whatever they did on it. Um, and I can't imagine in this day and age uh, how they how they would get around all the different directors and stuff. Absolutely, like it would be such a mess if this had happened in 2016 with the way you know the way things are now. But uh, you know, it's just a complete, it's a whole different system, a whole different generation in the in 39. So yeah. <clears throat> so and uh, so let, let's get on to. Let's get on to it. Now, usually we we kind of um, kind of go through the plot. I, I don't since this movie's so long. I don't want to go through every single scene. I kind of want to go through kind of an overview of the plot of this film, uh, and then we can kind of talk about different aspects of, of the production as we go on. Uh, but again, I, we're not going to get into nitty gritty like we usually do because this is a four hour long movie. <laughs> so, um, so the the movie is uh, starts in the pre Civil War South. Uh, and we have Scarlett O'Hara, who lives in in a, a Terra, which is a plantation uh, that that her father owns. Uh, and it, and I didn't know this was a thing to name your your property. <laughs> this is apparently a thing uh, <laughs> to name your property. I uh, I'm gonna come up uh, with a with, with a name for my house here. I don't know. I, I, I guess it's just it's a southern thing. I guess it might be. A it has thing. to be a southern thing. Um. So so Scarlett O'Hara is a. Uh, I would say probably the most unlikable p- protagonist in history. What a bitch, bro! <laughs> I, I'm 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 sent through this this screening right, and I'm just like, I mean, I, I've watched the film like many times since that first time a few years ago, and I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, I cannot stand this woman. I cannot stand this woman for anything. It's like. She, I, I I get she's like the main character. Everything's revolving around her. This is essentially like if you read the novel and then you watch the movie, it's essentially a coming of age story. As Scar, you know, Scarlet goes through all these experiences, especially you know due to the American Civil War going on and all that. And you know, she's she supposedly matures, but like she's still the same, like conniving, manipulative, just unlikable kind of spoiled brat. I don't think that ever changes with her, and it's just. No, and she's like that. she's like that to the very end. To the very end of the movie, she's like that. I mean, there are moments where she has, where she's grown up and she has mature. She matures a little bit, but for the most, that selfishness, that that self centeredness, never really changes, even until the very, very, very end of the film. Like at the very end of the film, all she is concerned about, like after, uh, <laughs> and again, if you're listening to this, if you're listening to this podcast. We go into spoilers here. After um, Melanie dies, the only thing she's concerned about is herself. She's not concerned about anything else. Her child just died. Melanie just died, and she's only concerned about herself and how things affect her. Uh, she she is she is still one of the most um, one of the most uh, unlikable protagonists in the entire history of film. Uh, and what I what's interesting is that despite that. There was a huge, um, a huge, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A huge deal made out of who they would cast in this role because this role was very highly sought after. Oh, I was hoping you get to this. Uh, <laughs> this, do, do you realize there's been books, there's been made for TV movies, <laughs> made just about this aspect of the production? 
The Search for Scarlet. The Search for Scarlet took two years while they had Clark Gable basically dangling on a rope for two years. This, and then him changing his mind, I want to do it. Then I don't want to do it. Then I do want to do it again. You know, you had this kind of a, a mad scramble in the background of all of that where David O'Selznick has to find the perfect Scarlett O'Hara. He wants to find his vision of Scarlett O'Hara. And he literally goes through 1,400, 1,400 interviews with potential actresses. Most of them, of course, unknowns. They have to be if it's 1,400 actresses that he looked at. And this process took about two years. And basically every single actress, a big actress at the time, was either rumored or considered by Selznick and by the project, production team for the role. Freaking Lucille Ball, Claudette Colbert, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, uh, Joan Fontaine, uh, Paulette Goddard, just uh, Catherine Hepburn, just uh, a who's who of actresses. Either they were considered or they were made it known publicly that they were going to try to go for the role. I mean, it's just – it's such a fascinating story, man. Just fascinating. It really is. And and again, kind of like Clark Gable, it's kind of hard to imagine anybody other than Vivian Lee playing this role uh, because she knocked it out of the park. I mean, you I mean, you know, sometimes people forget whenever someone is playing an unlikable character that that person is a good actor, you know, uh, and because they make you hate that person through through their on screen acting and Vivian Lee really I mean, Scarlett O'Hara annoys me so much that you have to give credit to Vivian Lee for that performance because that, that's her performance doing that. Now, some of it's the writing, obviously, but she perfectly exudes that brattiness, that just pure brattiness that you can't, that just kind of gets to your, like, underneath your skin. Uh, so it, it's kind of, it, it, I don't see anybody else playing that role other than other than her. Absolutely. And the thing about Vivian Lee as well is that she kind of came into contention very late into the uh, into everything. I think maybe about uh, it had to have been maybe about like six months or maybe not even six, maybe like four or three months before he was supposed to start shooting. She kind of came in and became this dark horse because the story behind that was I don't we even talk about like David Oselznick's brother, Myron Selznick, who was actually a uh, he was a. A Hollywood agent. So think about that. Like you have the two brothers. One is an agent. One is a producer. That's like the double threat right there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> so Myron, uh, as the story goes, uh, hopefully I'm telling it correctly. As the story goes, Myron was trying to uh, cast Lawrence Olivier in another movie. I can't remember the name of the movie. Which one it was? Mother might have been Wuthering Heights. I'm not sure. But um, he wanted to. He he wanted a copy of of a movie called Fire Over England. Now, I've never seen this movie. I really haven't heard of it until kind of doing my research for this movie. But it starred Olivier and Vivian. I think that's the, the film where they met, you know, because they were, they were a couple around the time Gone with the Wind was filming. Uh, and, and I think they were married for a while. So I think they divorced in, like, the 60s or something. I was but... about to say, I, I was going to ask if they were married yet because I knew they were married throughout the 30s, 40s, and at least 50s. Um, but I wasn't sure if they were married on this one or not. No, and I, I think they had, they had just – gotten together after a fire over England. So Myron is, is at a screen of fire over England and he's, I mean, he's kind of trying to cast Olivia, but then he sees this woman just kind of take over the screen and it's Vivian Lee. So in his head, he's like, that has to be that that's Scarlett O'Hara right there. So what happens is I don't really want to get into this now because it's, it's this is another like fascinating tidbit of like, uh, movie trivia. But when they were filming the burning of Atlanta scene, um, Myron shows up with Lawrence Olivier and with Vivian Lee. So Myron goes up to his brother, David, and he says, you know, I, there's somebody I want you to meet. And he says, I can't, I'm too busy right now. We're, we're, we're filming. And he goes like, you know, just, it'll take a minute. It'll be the minute you remember for the rest of your life. So he says, okay. He goes to her and Myron says, David, I want you to meet Scarlett O'Hara. And then, you know, Vivian Lee kind of blushes and all that. And she goes like, you know, hi, you know, I'm Vivian Lee. Nice to meet you. And David, David right there kind of saw what he saw. They did tests with Vivian Lee. I think she tested with, uh, with Leslie Howard. She tested with a few other guys. And in the end, that was it. 
Vivian Lee got the part. Now, I don't know if you know about this either, but after they announced Vivian Lee's casting, I think it was Hedda Hopper, that that sycophant. Um, she did a whole she wrote an article and she goes, you know, she hopes that the American public will protest this movie and boycott this movie because, you know, they ended up casting a British actress. And what does that say about, you know, all you American actresses, right, that were going for the role? So she can, like, she can go stick her head in a dumpster for all I care. But, um, so, yeah, Vivian Lee was cast. And, and I didn't know she was British until I watched that documentary. So <laughs> go oh, You didn't know she was British? I knew she was British. I did not know she was British. So that, that's, that should be a testament as to how good she is in this movie. Yeah, I mean, she has... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was about to mention another piece of casting. She she does have like a very like good. I mean, it's not like an over the top southern presence, but she does kind of convince you that she's this 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 genteel southern belle, right? Now, the object of her affection, uh, Ashley Wilkes, uh, who's played by Leslie Howard, who was also an English actor. Um, I don't think even tried. <laughs> to hide his accent because that's the most that's the least convincing southerner i've ever seen <laughs> and, and it's the I, oldest 22 year old i've ever seen yeah i know right i think he was uh in his 40s at that point right i think he was in his 40s whenever he made that film um Bro, did and, you hear about like all the makeup that selzing made him put on just yeah. to make him look younger <laughs> yes yes now he's a great he's a great actor and like his acting was very good in the film but i mean he didn't even attempt the accent it, it, it was it, it, that was a he was just being British. <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious, I, bro. I, honestly, bro, I think he was trying to copy uh, Gable because Gable went on record like even before they started filming, he goes like, "I'm not doing no Southern accent." Like you can forget about that. <laughs> I guess Leslie Howard just followed his footsteps. But he at least sounds I'm, American, I'm not right? He sounds American. That's all you really need. Like <laughs> Leslie Howard didn't even try. He sounds like a Yankee, bro. One <laughs> <laughs> of some damn Yankees. Oh, uh, but anyway. Yeah, so the, the, I always find that. Now, he's still very good in the film, but it, no, it, it just, it just cracks is. me up. But <clears throat> so getting back to the plot, so Scarlett O'Hara. Uh, oh, and by the way, in the opening scene, just a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a, 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 a trivia note here. Eagle-eyed viewers will ca- will catch uh, at the very beginning when Scarlett is kind of entertaining to two suitors uh two jabronis two, two guys that are, have no shot with her um one of them is a future superman <laughs> george reeves plays one of the brothers that's uh basically hitting on scarlet O'Hare at the very beginning yes sir one, one of the few films that he ha- appeared in uh, one of the few high profile films he appeared in uh before heading on to be superman in the 1950s I just wanted to mention that. Throw that out there. <laughs> of course, man. I'll pop it away. Uh, anyway, so again, uh, Scarlett O'Hara, very unlikable protagonist. She, she's a very she's a spoiled brat. Uh, one of uh, uh, the children of, of the O'Hara clan, obviously, uh, that lives at Terra. Uh, they, they go to a, a barbecue, a party at Twelve Oaks, which is the ha- which is the uh, the Wilkes farm, the Wilkes plantation, and she basically has had the hots for Ashley Wilkes uh, for a long mm-hmm. time. And she wants to marry Ashley, but Ashley is he 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 has feelings for her, but he he's not gonna. He, but he's um, but he thinks that what is the excuse he gives her that that he and Melanie uh, are more compatible or something like that. They never really go into it, but he basically decides he's gonna marry Melanie, who's played by Olivia de Havilland, um, and that's that. Which which pisses off Scarlett because because she, she being so self centered thinks that Ashley belongs to her. Well, if you remember, um, I for, I think it might have been a Scarlet's father who told her, but I, I can't remember. It might have been Scarlet's father. It might have been even Rev who goes like, you know, the Wilkes has married their cousins. So at the, when I when I heard that, I'm like, so they live in Shelbyville then? Because... <laughs> I mean, that was the thing though. Uh, uh, the Simpsons fans will will understand that joke. <laughs> I get it. I got it. I got it. But I mean, that was a thing back in the day. People would marry their cousins, um, and and that's and that's what happened. So. So Scarlet, in a kind of fit of jealousy, um, decides to kind of uh, uh, well. Before that, the, the, again, we were talking about how this is in the eve of the Civil War. There, there's you know at this big party, this big barbecue they're having. There's a a very big discussion amongst all the men about you know taking arms against the North, taking arms against the Yankees. And during this barbecue, during the, this uh, this party, 
the news breaks out that the South has, you know, it has seceded and is going to go against the Union, right? Go against the the the, the North. So all the men, of course, run to to go enlist and be and be part of the war, uh, including uh, Melanie's brother, who's uh, Charles, I think his name is. Uh, yes. Who who also has the hots for for uh, for um, Scarlett O'Hara, and uh, in a fit of jealousy and a fit of trying to not jealousy, in a fit of trying to get Ashley to be jealous, she agrees to marry him, even though she has no interest in the guy whatsoever. Yeah, this is, this is just the beginning, you know. Like as the audience was worried, this is like the first step in seeing like just how conniving she can be. This how like spoiled and. Uh, manipulative she, she her her personality is <laughs> exactly so another bit of, bit of trivia that I, I i learned in the research of this film a lot of people didn't like the parts that they were uh that they were playing in the film you know clark gable did not like the part of 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 uh rep butler um uh leslie howard did not like the part of, of ashley wilkes he said that he whenever he would come home for, uh, from a days of work he said that he he felt like he looked like a fairy doorman <laughs> <laughs> Bro, <laughs> but that's the thing. Okay, okay, okay. Well, with Gable, it, it's it's a little easier to kind of sympathize because at at this point, when he's making this movie, Gone with the Wind is like on its on track to be like the the biggest novel of all time. It's the most popular novel of all time at this point, and it's only been out for a couple years. So he feels like you know the the public is like going to be they're going to like nitpick every little thing he does if it's not according to the rep butler i read about in the book then it's not rep butler like he felt like you know like he felt so much pressure to be this perfect rep butler that you know he kind of he was always on and off with the production oh i, I do want to do this i don't want to do this you know like he'd always be having like second guessing himself because he, he felt the pressure which goes to show you that Living up to fan expectations in Hollywood has always been a thing long before superhero movies ever came around. There you go. <laughs> exactly. And Clark Gable as Rhett Butler is the poster boy for that. I mean, how many times, like every time there's a new superhero, there's a new Batman cast or a new Superman cast or a new Spider-Man cast or whatever, Joker cast. How many times do you read online about all the people complaining about oh he's not going to be a good whatever and he, she's not going to be a good whatever imagine if, if if the internet existed in 1939 the amount of scrutiny that people would have had about this movie in online forums bitching about it on facebook like clark gable that guy blah, blah, blah you know so like just imagine so i, I think oh, oh oh my god i'm picturing that right now because it, it, i'm harkening back to and this is and no, i'm not trying to say these two books are on the same level but I'm try. I would pick if this was 2016, bro. I would picture it the same way as the whole thing with the Fifty Shades of Grey with Christian Grey with that casting nonsense. Not you know? my ret. Not my ret. Exactly as John <laughs> Oliver would say if he was alive in 1936. So not my ret. <laughs> uh, did I ever tell you if I finally got around to watching that movie? It's terrible. It's a bad movie. Isn't it terrible? It's so bad. Isn't it? it you know, it's so bad. It's man. not. It's not even that it's bad. It commits the worst crime ever. It's not that even that it's bad, as it's boring, and it that is the worst crime a movie can make is is, is being boring. Like it's it's cheese, but it's not even entertaining cheese. You know, like if it was, no. it was if it, it was funny, there there'd be some redeeming quality to it. But it's not even funny. It's not like funny. it takes itself so serious. It's not and funny. It's, it's 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 boring. It's not sexy. And then I saw a trailer for the new one like the other day when I was at the movies. I forgot what movie I was watching, but there was a trailer for it, and I was like, really, we're doing this again? <sighs> anyway. Back to back to nineteen thirty nine. Yeah, back to this. <laughs> so, so the point I was making with uh, the the actors not liking their roles. Uh, what I wanted to say, so the guy who played Charles, uh, his name was Rand Brooks. Uh, he hated that role because he was portrayed like such a doofus and such a weakling, right? But in reality, apparently, it was like this rugged art doorsman, and he was so annoyed <laughs> that he had to play this like mom, like not a mama's boy, but this kind of milk toast uh, weakling little. Uh, not Rhett Butler character, right? So I right. Just, I just find that amusing. But uh, but, but the, the thing about that too is that if you really research the uh, what what Margaret Mitchell was going for with Gone with the Wind, as far as like kind of some of the underlying themes, you find out about how, like basically, with okay, in the center of, of this story is like is the romance with Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara, right? But in the background, of course, is the Civil War. 
and like this romanticized version of the old South that after the Civil War is just completely shattered, never to be, never to come back. And, you know, the way that the book is written, it almost seems like after the Civil War that Southern men weren't men anymore. Like, they literally had their balls cut off by the North during the Civil War. And, you know, there was, it was, there was just a period of just unmanliness. Like, the men weren't men anymore. And it wasn't because you know, the society didn't feel they were men. It's like the men themselves didn't feel that felt very unmanly because they're the losers. So I don't think it was intentional that it was, they were portraying it like that. Like for example, like Ashley looking the way he does, Charles acting the way he does. But I I wouldn't put it past like the writers, maybe like Sidney Howard or Ben Hector, whoever was in charge of writing this portion of it or most of it to kind of take that theme and kind of project it more in, in the script. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you there. It, it's, uh, <laughs> I just find it it's just so kind of almost cartoonish how Charles is, is portrayed on this. Right. Oh, <laughs> really, Miss Scarlet? Really? Oh, you made me so happy, Miss Scarlet. <laughs> uh, he's such a such a doofus. Um, <laughs> but before before he does before she does do that, uh, she does. Um, uh, this is uh, before she does that. After she professes her her love to Ashley, who who kind of turns her down, uh, this is whenever she meets Rep Butler, who accidentally uh, was listening in on their whole declaration of love for each other. And this is when you start the whole Scarlet Rep Butler uh, romance. Will they? Won't they? Romance kind of thing. Don't you want to marry me? I'm going to marry Melanie. But you can't. Not if you care for me. Oh my dear, why must you make me say things that will hurt you? How can I make you understand? You're so young and I'm thinking you don't know what marriage means. I know I love you and I want to be your wife. You don't love Melanie. She's like me, Scarlett. She's part of my blood and we understand each other. But you love me. How could I help loving you? You who have all the passion for life that I lack. But that kind of love isn't enough to make a successful marriage for two people who are as different as we are. Why don't you say it, you coward? You're afraid to marry me. You'd rather live with that silly little fool who can't open a mouth except say yes, no, and raise a parcel of mealy mouth grass just like him. You mustn't say things like that about Melanie. Who are you to tell me I must? You led me on. You you made me believe you wanted to marry me. Now, Scarlett, be fair. I never at any time... You did. It's true, you did. I hate you till I die. I can't think of anything bad enough to call you. The war started? Uh, sir, you... You should have made your presence known. In the middle of that beautiful love scene? That wouldn't have been very tactful, would it? But don't worry. Your secret is safe with me. Sir, you are no gentleman. And you, miss, are no lady. Oh. But don't think that I hold that against you. Ladies have never held any charm for me. First you take a low, common advantage of me. Then you insult me. I meant it as a compliment. And I hope to see more of you when you're free of the spell of the elegant Mr. Wilkes. He doesn't strike me as half good enough for a girl of your... Uh, what was it? Your passion for living? How dare you? You aren't fit to wipe his boot. <laughs> and you were going to hate him for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's funny because this is considered the big, like the, one of the biggest romantic movies of all time, and it is, but there... Nobody except for they don't Mel get together till three hours in. <laughs> yeah, and but but the thing is, like Melanie <laughs> is pretty much the only one that ends up in a happy relationship. Like she's she, the only good, per like really good person in this movie. Right, it's she's Melanie. the only one that kind of has her own romantic ideals fulfilled. Because I mean, even though Ashley loves her, he also loves Scarlet, right? And then Rhett loves Scarlet, and he ends up with her, but. You know, their romance is, like, so uh, shaky and, and, and rocky from the whole time. Scarlet only realizes she loves Rhett at the very end. So it's, and, and even then, it's pretty it's pr pretty much because she just doesn't want to be alone. 
So it, it's this. It, it's funny that it's considered this romantic movie when really no one gets what they want. So <laughs> <laughs> except Melanie, Melanie's the only one who gets what they what she wants. Um. So and she dies. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just hilarious. Um. So we fast forward. The war's uh, the war has, is in full swing, and we and Charles is out of the movie now because he's dead. Charles gets killed in action. Um, he doesn't even get. He doesn't even have a hero's. Well, the letter says it was a hero. He was still a hero, but he doesn't even have a hero's death. He dies from the measles. He doesn't even die gallantly on the <laughs> again, battlefield. Again, another another shot at making him look like like a like a like a doofus. Like he doesn't even get. Sh- he doesn't die exactly. Like you say, doesn't he doesn't die. Get in shot, the- he doesn't even get stabbed. He doesn't get his head he cut off sick. or anything. He gets sick, bro. Um. So he dies. Uh. And uh, uh, Scarlet is now a widow. And it fast forward to her uh, supposed to be in mourning, but she clearly doesn't care because she never liked them anyway. Um, and she's she had like this charity ball uh, to raise funds for for the Confederate Army. Where Rhett once again shows up. He's now kind of like a big war. Not a, he's not a war hero. What is he? He's kind of like he runs like guns for the for the Confederates or something like that. That's yeah, he's a blockade runner. Yeah, he's a blockade runner. Right. So for a profit. Yeah, for which profit. is a, a pretty lucrative idea this time around. He's not taking sides. He just whoever can pay more. You know, yeah. that's very, uh, very, uh, what? That's very, very Rhett Butler. Let's right. just call it that. But he gets he gets rich, and he's at this the charity dance, and you know he he runs into Scarlet again, and there's kind of one of those old fashioned like uh, bidding things where you bid on on people to like to dance. <laughs> oh, uh, you mean like slavery? Like slavery, <laughs> <laughs> except this time it's women. So you know. Um, and you know he bids on Scarlet, and it's very controversial because no, she's in mourning. She because back then you were in mourning for months. Uh, she's in mourning. She you're not allowed. To, and but, but Scarlet doesn't care because she never cared about Charles and decides to dance with them. anyway. in one of the most uh, kind of iconic scenes in the movie, you see them dancing together with her in this black like mourning dress, and as, as the, she dances with Rhett Butler, and that's kind of like the so that's kind of I, I the love beginning I, of the... I I love this because of the shock. Like as soon as she says, you know, I'll accept. And you hear the <gasps> like all the gasping. Like I could imagine in 2016, these people would run to their phones and put on Facebook, "This scarlet bitch is actually going to dance with Rhett Butler." <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> like the phony outrage from these like uppity people. It's, 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 it was very amusing. <laughs> Well, uh, what, I, what I love is like, yeah, is because she it was right before she says she accepts. as like that old guy on stage. She's like, she will not accept. She will and not then, accept. <laughs> and she's like, oh yes, I will. <laughs> so it's a great scene. It's very. I mean, it looks it looks fantastic on screen, you know. And then the the, the shot of them dancing together looks looks phenomenal. It, I mean, it you is know how very... that was. Do you, you want to talk about how that was shot? Like like what they use for the dancing. Go ahead. So Clark Gable is a very insecure guy. When it comes to dancing, because the the dude has two left feet, so what they do for him is they build like this little platform for him that spins. So when you actually see them dancing on screen, it's not really actually him like turning her while they're waltzing. It's they're standing on the moving platform, and the platform is turning them because the guy is so self conscious about not being able to dance he thinks it's gonna like if they see me dance he, he goes like if they see me dance it's gonna kill their image of, of me as rep butler so they helped him out they made a little moving platform for him and that's what he's on while he's quote unquote dancing so a neat little hollywood trick there of course uh <laughs> of course because you know you got to protect the image man exactly you protect the image <laughs> Um, and so this kind of begins. So the before was when they met. Now this begins kind of their love hate relationship because before she didn't like him, and now that he does this, like now she kind of likes him. But but she's like, so it's clear throughout the film that even though her heart belongs to to Ashley, she's still very like she's very attracted to Red Butler. Of course. I mean, I'm attracted to Red Butler. That guy just oozes charisma. <laughs> is, there some, is there something you want to come out and say on this on the on our podcast? <laughs> I'll admit it. <laughs> um, so, you know, we get – I think I think after this, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg happens. And so it's interesting. This is a, a historical drama, right? Uh, it's a historical romance, and war plays a big factor in it, but you never actually see the war. You see the results of the war. You see war kind of happening around it, but you never actually see the war. So they mention uh, Gettysburg, uh, 
which as we all know from our from eighth grade history was very uh, was a big turning point in in, in the Civil War. Um, uh, the, the, you know the the there is a, a what is it called whenever um whenever uh soldiers get a break and they get to go home for a little bit the before furlough they, furlough thank you so they get a furlough for Christmas or is it Thanksgiving I think it's Christmas Christmas this is Christmas uh and uh you know Ashley comes back home he, he's happy to see his wife uh but then you know of, of course he has a uh, uh a private meeting with 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 Scarlett who. And again, once again, they come, uh, profess their love to each other. And once again, Ashley turns her down. And they they still kiss, though. And it's, you know, Scarlett is still kind of trying to get in there because that's how she is. Yeah. What did she make him, like a scarf or something? It's, it's like, like a belt for his, like, jacket, like a, a, a sash or something. <laughs> Talk about unmanly, bro. <laughs> again, once again, like it, you know, it's funny because you mentioned that again. It, it, there is lots of themes of masculinity in this because he 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 is not like an, he's not the most, he's not a macho man. No, he's know? not. He's not the kind, and of he's guy never portrayed he, as one. He's not really. No, I mean, he's a war hero and everything, but he's not someone that you think of as a you know a masculine figure. Was Clark Gable, Rip Butler, definitely is. He comes off as this cavalier. He's like Han Solo before Han Solo, right? So there he, you he go. comes Perfect. off as this uh, macho cavalier dude. It's so much as basically committing marital rape later in the movie. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it, you know it, it's just interesting that they kind of they they portrayed them like that. Yeah, definitely. But it is interesting though, just the characterizations and all. So again, we fast forward again, and you know Ashley's back to war. Uh, Melanie's pregnant, and uh, the uh, Scarlet is kind of helping out in like a hospital, like a makeshift hospital in Atlanta. Is in Atlanta, um, where basically everyone, is, you know, they it's not it's not a hospital. It's what is it? It's like um, uh, is it a train station? Well- yeah, well, yeah, it's a, it's a transition that they made into a volunteer hospital. Yeah, it's a volunteer house. So she's working as volunteer, and you know she doesn't really want to be there, but she's doing it anyway. It's one of the few moments where, like, you can see that she's kind of matured because she's still doing her duty, but she doesn't really want to do it. She just is doing it because you know it would look bad if she didn't, right? So she's mm-hmm. she's doing her duty, and she's like a volunteer nurse, and it's. I think at this point, this is whenever you kind of see. This is when you see like the results of war. This is when you see a little bit of the horror of war, and um. Again, without actually seeing any conflict or action, you see the, the, the results of it. And what is it, I find interesting about this film is that it really kind of takes a little bit of a brutal look at war, even though, I mean, it's 1939, so you don't see a lot of, of, you don't see any gore, really. But they certainly talk about amputating legs and limbs and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So it's it's a very, I, I, I don't think, I mean, someone can, a historian can correct me, but I don't think I've seen like an earlier representation of war in that kind of brutal of a manner on film. You might be right about that because I'm trying to remember as well, like a, like a film before Gone with the Wind that portrayed war like this. And I, and I really can't, maybe because it's later or something, but I, can't, I nothing comes to mind at this point for I mean, me. The only so, thing I can think of is maybe uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Is a little maybe. Uh, I don't think that's the same though. It's not the same honest. though. You're right. It's not the same. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. But uh, that's the only thing that came to mind. Um, but during all this, uh, Melanie, who's pregnant with Ashley's child, uh, is is going into labor, and Scarlett needs to. You know, Scarlett is trying to get uh, trying to get the the doctors to come leave the hospital to take care. Uh, of the, good luck to, to take care of the baby. But bro, Doctor Me just shuts her down. Like I'm not leaving here for no baby. You got soldiers, you know, <laughs> that are dying. And then and now, now this is one of the times when you watch the film and your 2016 uh, uh, brain that is very um, sensitive to like. Uh, whether you want to call it political correctness or racial sensitivity or whatever you want to call it, uh, kind of it kind of goes, ooh, that's not that's not great. Uh, whatever we see, uh, <laughs> uh, the 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 slave uh, maid, I think her name is Prissy, Prissy, um, <laughs> who who decides, oh, I can deliver a baby, but the way she's portrayed, not the best uh, representation of. of of black people on on camera 
That's her actual voice, by the way. I was shocked. <laughs> I thought she was. I thought she was acting like literally, like even up to the voice. But no, that's her actual voice. It's still. They, they, they interviewed her in '88 for that documentary, and she sounded exactly the same. <laughs> exactly the same as an 80 year old woman. Exactly the same. <laughs> she still. I can't. She like, still it blew still... my mind, bro. <laughs> <laughs> She still kind of, I mean, it's it's it still kind of makes you it kind of makes you pucker up a little bit, like oh, that's not great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, neither. I mean, for that matter, neither is Mammy, who's like a a bigger character in the film. But it's still kind of like oof. I I can see why black people have a problem with this film. I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, uh, our, our our old Uncle Tomisms, you know. <laughs> so um, basically, it ends up coming that uh, at the end of the day. Um, uh, Prissy, who said that she could help the Lord Baby, ends up she's lying. It is a dirty liar. <laughs> she's yeah. a dirty liar. She's wanted to get out of there. Um, <laughs> and and Scarlet basically has to help Melanie uh, deliver the baby herself. Well, according to Doctor Me, there ain't nothing to deliver no baby. So you know anybody could do it apparently. So then, what's your use then? <laughs> anybody could do it. Like, all right then, whatever. <laughs> And uh, shortly after that, they, they, you know, as as the as the Union Army is kind of getting closer to the uh, to Atlanta, uh, and the city is in, in is in more danger of, of basically being destroyed. She, uh, Scarlet, you know, decides that she needs to get out of there, and with Melanie and the baby and 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 everybody, uh, she she gets uh, in one of the better scenes of the one of the more funnier scenes. She gets Prissy to go find Rhett, who's at. Who's at a whorehouse? Let's just face it. That's a whorehouse. It's, it's, it's a whorehouse. He's at a whorehouse. Um, and uh, and I love how the whorehouse is still in business as fire is all around them. You know, yeah. like the whorehouse is still open, folks. Yeah, so of course it is. You're trying to escape thing. Atlanta. You know, you want a little bit of a <laughs> goodbye present from the city. Go right in. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? Exactly. Um, so what I find what I find funny is how they get around certain things like – like the the one the one woman who's basically the the the, the madam of the whorehouse. She, she has a minor role in the film, and they they talk about how she is like this. I don't know how they phrase it, but they basically get around calling her a madam, you know. But she's basically that's what she is. And you know, he's at a whorehouse. They don't call it they don't call it a whorehouse, uh, but that's what it is. Uh, and it it it's it just amusing to me how they take how in 1939 they get around um, talking frankly about those things. Well, the, well, th that Hayes guy, man, he's uh, he's he's kind of a pain in the ass. So, I mean, the fact that they were able to kind of outsmart him and kind of just sneak in references like that, it's a credit to to the production. I gotta say, <laughs> um, that little twerp Hayes, man. Uh, it's funny because the most famous line of the film, probably the most famous line in cinema, frankly, my dear, don't give a damn, caused him a little bit of a headache um, with the Hayes Code. Uh, but apparently you find a loophole which says like if you if it is part of a literary how do they put it if it's like some sort of like literary reference um then you are allowed to use it and i think that they the way they i think that the, that was originally intended for like you know biblical passages or things like that like right. if you were to say hell or damnation uh but because this was part of the original book they were allowed to kind of get away with it uh, I think that's how they got away with the word damn. Yeah, I think that was the loophole. Like it, it, <laughs> it was a reference. It was like a direct line from the book. Yes, something like that. So, and it was like it had to do with historical context or something like that. So they were able to get away with it with yeah. that little loophole, which is awesome. Uh, but back, back. But, to what, what, but, but, but Adolfo, what about frankly, my dear? I just don't care. Like, doesn't that have the same kick? Well, of course it does. Of course it does. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, That's so, sarcasm, folks. People, it does not have the same kick. I love using "damn." "Damn" is my favorite word. So, um, so now we get to see the the burning of Atlanta, which I th it was my favorite point. Is my favorite part of the film. Uh, it's it's basically the highest point in the film as far as uh, 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 production value and um, uh, just it 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 kind of climaxes in the middle of the film, even though there's still another two hours to go because that that is just such a high point of the film. It's very it's a very um, 
impressive shot. Actually, we missed one shot. Is it, it's earlier in the film whenever they're t- whenever she gets to the the hospital for the first time, and then you have that crane shot where it pulls back and you see the hundreds oh. and hundreds of dead bodies. I forgot. Oh, I can't believe yeah. we forgot to talk about that. That's one. That's my favorite shot in the whole movie. Um, okay, I will finish up and then I'll say my part on. No, it. no, go ahead and say your part. Okay, so for those Simpsons fans out there, there is a classic episode of The Simpsons where Homer gets a free trampoline and all the kids in the neighborhood come to the Simpsons' house to jump on the trampoline and they all get hurt. I don't know if you've seen this episode of Dolpho. I have not. I don't think I've seen that one. Okay, so he gets a trampoline and all the kids in town like are like, oh my god, he has a trampoline. So... They come, they start jumping on a trampoline, and one after another, they get hurt. Whether they ju- they hit their head on the bar, or they, they, you know, they, like I, I remember like Flanders' kids were both jumping at the same time, and they bumped into each other, like literally midair. It's, it's a hilarious scene. But after like the last kid gets hurt, which they literally like a, a shot for shot of the Gone with the Wind scene with the crane, like the crane shot of all the kids holding their arms or their legs. Like it has the same musical score too, <laughs> you know. Like the, the of the of the injured Confederates, you know. They play the same music as the the camera goes over all the kids in pain, and then Marge goes over like I told you the trampoline was a bad idea. So, <laughs> so and and for years, for years, I thought that was a Simpsons creation. Like I didn't know that that was a reference to a famous movie until I finally saw Gone with the Wind from start to finish, and it was and. Bro, when I watch these old movies and I see Simpsons references, I call them Simpsons references because I saw them Simpsons first. So I'm like, oh, that's from The Simpsons. And then when he hits, he's like, The Simpsons took it from this. And that was the moment I had when I watched Gone with the Wind. And I saw that famous crane shot over the injured Confederate soldiers. That's the trampoline scene from The Simpsons. So <laughs> I might just watch that after we finish recording right now because I'm in the mood to watch that episode again. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe or, isn't that marathon going on right now? Or is no, it over? It, it's it's over. Yeah, thirteen oh. days. Okay, and uh, yeah. Well, after the like the freaking after like the fifth day, I stopped watching. That's when you get into like the later seasons, and those kind of suck. So now, before we get back to Gone with the Wind, and as the Simpsons kind of soar, I was I was listening to a podcast. I don't remember which one it was, where they were talking about the Simpsons, and they 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 maintain the the people on the podcast were maintaining. That season eight is the highest point, and then after that, it goes downhill. Do you agree with that? Eight is a high point. Eight is one of my favorite seasons, but I think six or seven is the highest point. Honestly, okay. I me, think the I think they were saying after eight, it's more hit and miss. Oh, to me, like the I think every episode until uh, when you start eleven, after eleven, it's hit or miss for me. Even though 11 and 12 are still very good seasons, with me it starts 11 or 12 as the hit and miss episodes. I think everything 1 through 10 is a classic. Everything 1 through 10 is a classic. But once you get to 11, that's when it starts being more hit or miss. All right. Good to know. <laughs> all right. So back to uh, Gone with the Wind. So, yeah, that, that shot with the crane shot of, over all the hundreds of, 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 uh, of, sold, of the Confederate soldiers, one of the best shots ever. Uh, I, I think it's – it's probably if you made a list of the 100 most iconic uh, movie shots or something, it would have to be in the top ten. It's just that good. Um, but so yeah, so we're now at the point of of the burning of Atlanta, which is my favorite sequence in the film uh, because it just looks so good on screen. I think even in 2016 terms, even though you can kind of tell it's it's on a stage, it's on a sound stage, it just looks so good. The production involved here. Mm-hmm. Just, this is the first scene shot for the movie. It's so impressive. This scene, the the actual burning of Atlanta, the that all was the very first thing shot for the movie. Mm-hmm. Because when they shot this, they still didn't have a Scarlett O'Hara. Remember, as I said earlier, this was when they were filming this scene is when Selznick met Vivian Lee while they were filming this scene. So the Rhett Butler and the Scarlett O'Hara you see in the background of that scene are obviously stunt doubles. Sorry to break that illusion for everybody, but they're stunt doubles. <laughs> but, you know, it's just filmed very well, so we can't even notice the difference anyway. But anyway, so they're already on a tight schedule production-wise. There was no way they're going to be able to build a whole Atlantis set just to burn it, you know? So what can they do? Well, that MGM backlot was filled with a lot of old sets. 
King Kong was one of them. I did know this actually. We you did know this. There's a few other movies that I now uh, they're now they're they're leaving me right now, but they're on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember what other movies there were, but a whole bunch of other sets on the MGM bat. Like, I don't remember King Kong because that's the most famous one. And they decided, you know what? These sets need to go. Instead of just breaking them down, why don't we set them on fire? So what you see burning in that scene, the burning of Atlanta, are all the old movie sets. Like that big, like wide shot as like the carriage is crossing and you see that big like tower collapse. Those are actually the big gates from King Kong. So that that was a neat little piece of trivia when I found out. That that little tower collapsing is actually the King Kong gate from from that movie. So See, now, very what, cool stuff. What I never understood is why did Selznick have that set? Well, he because, produced King Kong. Oh, he produced King Kong. Okay, that makes sense then. Because because King Kong was an RKO movie, so that's why I was confused. Okay, that makes sense if he produced it. Yes. Okay. Um. But yeah, so so it, it, the whole sequence is uh, Rhett getting them out of Atlanta. Uh, so and and so that they can get back to Terra. But at one point, after he gets him out, he kind of has to go on, on on his own to go help fight for the cause, basically. And then uh, kind of leaves Scarlet and um, Melanie and Prissy to to head on back to Terra by themselves. Um, and this is after this point, I think, is where we get the intermission. Which... Yes, I, I love that scene though because it, leave it to Rhett Butler, bro. He goes like, you know. <laughs> decides to join the confederates right when they're about on the point of losing the damn war you know and then what's his line he goes like you know i've always had a soft spot for lost causes so <laughs> I mean, that guy, just that that line reading is perfect bro just like freaking rhett butler you know <laughs> like he, like he kind of just shatters her illusion you know he's gonna take her to terror nope i'm gonna go join the confederates now <laughs> after i spent like or the last like two or three years you know, staying neutral essentially. Now I'm going to go join them. So <laughs> it's it's very Rip Butlery. <laughs> very Rip Butlery, exactly. Just a great, what a great scene, man. And he kisses her like that. Kiss is is, is some is the magical kiss, bro, right there. And then he makes her feel bad about it, where he's like, you know, you know, uh, he says something to the effect of, you know, hopefully it won't be on your conscience when I die in the battlefield. You know, so <laughs> bro, what 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 a great movie, man. It is a fantastic film, man. Oh, Red, please don't go. You can't leave me, please. I'll never forgive you. I'm not asking you to forgive me. I'll never understand or forgive myself. And if a bullet gets me, so help me, I'll laugh at myself for being an idiot. But there's one thing I do know, and that is that I love you, Scarlett. In spite of you and me and the whole silly world going to pieces around us, I love you. Because we're alike. Bad lots, both of us. Selfish and shrewd, but able to look things in the eyes and call them by their right names. Don't hold me like that. Scarlet, look at me. I love you more than I've ever loved any woman. And I've waited longer for you than I've ever waited for any woman. Let me alone. Here's a soldier of the South who loves you, Scarlet. Wants to feel your arms around him. Wants to carry the memory of your kisses into battle with him. Never mind about loving me. You're a woman sending a soldier to his death with a beautiful memory. Scarlet, kiss me. Kiss me once. You know, down Codley, nasty thing, you. They were right. Everybody was right. You, you are a gentleman. A minor point at such a moment. Here. If anyone lays a hand on that nag, shoot him. But don't make a mistake and shoot the nag. Oh, go on. I want you to go. I hope a cannibal lands slap on you. I hope you're blown into a million pieces. Never I... mind the rest. I follow your general idea. And when I'm dead on the order of my country, I hope your conscience hurts you. <laughs> Goodbye, Scarlet. <laughs> so, Scarlet has come back to Terra. And finds it. It's pretty much deserted. There's no. There's no help anymore. There's no servants anymore. It's just her family. Well, her family minus her mother who died, uh, right from like one of those one of those illnesses that don't exist anymore. Um, she died, and the and her 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 father has gone crazy. Yeah, and, fa- uh, just just like Uncle Billy, by the way. You know. Oh yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
a little foreshadowing, folks, for for our next episode. Yeah. But uh, so, so he is our died. boy, Uncle Billy. She has died. He's he's gone. He's gone nuts. And uh, all that's left is her sisters, and the the plantation is in ruins. Um, so the <clears throat> so so this is whenever she gets the uh, the 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 big hero line. Uh, I she'll never go hungry again, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I love that, that that closing shot before the intermission, the, like the wide shot of Tara in ruins with the gray skies. Love the juxtaposition to the opening, like wide shot of Tara with, when she's with her father, and you see like the big, beautiful green plantation, and then you come to the end of the first half, and it's in ruins. So yeah. great, great juxtaposition there. To, yeah. see, to, to show us where we're at at this point. And, and and what's great about this scene is that is about this part is but right before the intermission is that this is such a good is a great uh, pivotal character moment for her because you know she she gets she delivers that line uh as god is my witness i'll never go hungry again or i'll never be hungry again i think it is um and i think she also says if i have to uh lie cheat or kill uh, yeah. i'll never go hungry again and that is whenever that now as as selfish as we've seen her self-centered as we've seen her up until this point now we kind of see a little bit of a different person and then in the second half but it's still driven by a self-centeredness, but it's right. driven by also a survivalist. Like, no one is going to take care of me. I have to take care of myself, and I'm going to do whatever is possible to be my own woman. And t- So I can see how she kind of is like a feminist icon in some ways, mm-hmm. um, but it is still driven from a self-centered point of view of, like, uh, I can only like look. I can only. No one else is going to look out for me, so I have to do it myself. And I will do anything I can to make sure no one ever, you know, screws me again. So and, and yeah, and all this kind of hits on another theme of the of the novel, which is survival. I mean, even Margaret Mitchell, like when asked, like what's what was like your motivation for writing this book? Like one of the things she said in interviews is like, I've always wondered, like the people who survive, like. Things like this, like post-war America, you know, or other like disasters. Like there's people who survive and there's people who don't. There's people who claw their way out of, you know, you know, poverty or whatnot. You know, and like what traits do these people possess that they're able to do that while others can't? So that was something she wanted also to explore while writing this novel. Like who – like it's – you know, like you said, it's about survival. Like who are these people that are able to survive things like this and what – in their character, what in their personality is able to allow them to survive whereas others can't. So that's another – that hits on another theme of, of, of the novel and I guess of the story as a whole. With that, with that kind of new attitude, we kind of forge ahead into the second half, part two, if you will, uh, of the second part of the movie where – after the intermission, uh, where we find Scarlet. Uh, she's, she's now kind of taken over Tara since her, her father is crazy. Her mother's dead. She's the oldest daughter. And she's kind of uh, – Melanie is, uh, you know, up, you know, kind of uh, recuperating from the childbirth. She's the one in charge of everything. Um, she's out there picking cotton. She's out there doing whatever she needs to do to make sure Tara gets back on its feet. Uh, and, you know, the war, I think, at this point is over. And, you know the- – uh, Like when, it, when the part two starts, it's not over yet, but it's, pace, it's practically over. And then, like, uh, like a few scenes later, like you have Uncle Billy running in, and like the war is over. You know, Lee surrendered. You know, <laughs> so then, yeah. So I mean, at this point, the war is practically over, though. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I was getting to is because it, then a little bit, because because then the the reconstructionists who are painted as villains in this film, uh, the, the carpet, carpet baggers, baggers <laughs> the scallywags. Yeah. Oh, bro, bro, I had fun in my Civil War class learning about the carpet baggers and the scallywags and all the all these people. Like reconstruction is a very very uh, let's just say interesting time for this country. So yeah. um, let's, we're not going to get into it now. It's not necessarily a history lesson, but like. You know, consult your local library if you want to learn more about the Civil War, about Reconstruction. So, I mean, I'm talking like it's like freaking 1992. So, <laughs> so consult so, your local library, folks. So one of what one of the um, one of the carpetbaggers is their old. Uh, what is the what is the kind of overseer? Of overseer. The, yeah, he's the the old overseer who they dismissed right before the war, who was a Yankee uh, because he they basically uh, said that. Say, said without saying that he got some girl, some kind of 
white trash pregnant and then left yep. her. <laughs> uh, they 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 did not want that sort of scandal in their 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 house, so they they dismissed him. And now he was came back, and now he's the overseer, and he's he's looking for or sorry, see he's the he's a carpet bagger, and he's looking for them to pay kind of unreasonable taxes. Uh, and and Scarlet doesn't know really what to do uh, about. You know, now she's now she's in a situation where she's like she's backed into a corner and she has got to figure out how to pay the taxes to keep Tara. Yep. So who does she go to? So she goes to uh, she hears tell he, she hears tell of, of Rep Butler has been captured by the Union. So she goes to visit him, uh, pretending to be his sister, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> after she makes some after she makes a beautiful dress out of uh, out of out of. Uh, some curtains lying around in the house. She goes to visit Rep Butler in jail, uh, basically trying to get her, using her feminine wiles to help him to to get her. To... Well, she's trying to hide the fact that she she's dirt poor at yeah. this point. Like... And, and then and then Rhett kind of almost falls for it, and then he realizes, oh wait, you want something from me, and you you just want money. And then he but kind bro, of... bro, do you do you you remember how he figures it out <laughs> when he looks at her hands? Yes. He goes like, you know, these aren't ladies' hands; these are field hands. Like, what are you trying to pull, Scarlet, or something like that? And then that's when he, she goes like, "All right, it's all a lie," <laughs> you know. And that's when she try basically begs for the tax money. He goes like, "I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> like, even if I wanted to, like, his his money's like tied up in something." You yeah, know, cause that he, he because he's in jail and he, like he's not he doesn't have access to his money and and you know yeah. Um, now, although we did we no, because we're doing this more of an overview and not not exactly uh, going into more detail. There we missed one line earlier in the movie that I think is one of my favorite lines. It's it, it, you know we talk about Rip Butler being portrayed as as a manly man's man, a macho man. One of the best lines he has in the movie is this. I'm, I looked it up because I want to get it right. It's uh. No, I don't think I will kiss you. Although you need kissing badly. That's what's wrong with you. You should be kissed and often. And often. by someone who knows how. How? That yeah, goddamn, bro. Like, how how could he w- not want to play this part? Like, he looks... There has never been someone who, who like... If this was 20... Again, if this was 2016, people would kill for that role. He th- he doesn't look bad in this movie. He, he looks fantastic in this film. And by the way, that line goes over very well at the nightclub. I tried it. Oh yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, I, out of five, I only had three drinks splashed in my face. So <laughs> that, those are good odds. So, so before before she uh, before she goes to red, actually, there is one little detail, and, and it kind of shows how willing she is to um, how willing she is to uh, to do anything to protect Tara, Tara. A random kind of Union soldier passerby does kind of come in on the. Come into the house, and again, the Union being portrayed as villains here. Uh, he was the, he 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 is the deserter, so he he's not really uh, he's not really representative of the Union, but he's a deserter, and he he's in there and thinking the house is deserted, goes in to try to steal some things, and uh, he confronts Scarlet, who shoots him in the face, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a little bit. I mean, kind of uh, kind of gory for 1939. He shoots him. She shoots him in the face, and and you know. Uh, and Melanie helps him find the body, and it's like one of those things. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna take this stuff anymore. I'm. I'm I love gonna... Melanie, bro. Like, she was ready with the sword if 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 uh, yeah, uh Scarlet kind of wasn't gonna shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> she was sitting back there with the sword, like, I, like if, if if Scarlet can't do this, I'm I'm about to step up. <laughs> um. So she. So through some kind of more of kind of Scarlet again. Goes into town. She finds a uh, Frank uh, Kennedy. Kennedy, thank you. Uh, who's a he, who's who's wealthy. He owns like he owns like a mill. Uh, he owns like a shop in town. And she's and again, Scarlet thinking, I will do anything to get to to get what I need to do to make sure my family survives. Um, he basically uh, she charms him into marrying her, even though. She he was the fiance of uh, her sister. Her sister. <laughs> so once again, self centered Scarlet just does what she wants to do. I'll never get over that scene because she, li- bro, she goes like, you know, I forgot my gloves today, so I'm just gonna put my hand in your pocket to, to keep warm. <laughs> and, and much like Charles earlier in the movie, uh, after she you know marries him and after she basically takes over his business and starts running it, um. 
poor Frank doesn't get much much screen time because he gets killed. <laughs> he gets killed. <laughs> um, uh, uh, <clears throat> what is it? Um, what happens exactly? Oh, she because she comes home. And she went. She, she goes to the mill. Shanty town, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And then she gets attacked, and then she comes back home, and then uh, the. They raid uh, Frank, Ashley, and Rhett. Kind of raid the shanty town in revenge, right? Yeah, uh, and that's where Frank gets killed. Now, what's now in the book? In the book, I was about to say this, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. No, 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 no go no. ahead. You can, you can do it. So, in the book, they uh, they actually get the help from the Ku Klux Klan to do this, but they took out all references to the Ku Klux Klan from the movie version. Obviously, that was a Celtic decision because even in 1939, he knew, okay, this is going to be a little too much for, like, the African-American audience. So he took out any reference to the Ku Klux Klan. But in the novel, it is the Ku Klux Klan that helps them kind of raid the shantytown. Right. And and, and what's, what's kind of interesting about this is that you don't, you don't see the raid. You just see the, the women uh, – Melanie and Scarlett in the and, sewing and the circle, women. bro. Just, just, like I see sewing circles, and it's just like yeah. it's such a product of like the uh, early, uh, late nineteenth, early twentieth century, even like even before that, bro. Like it's just so like like nobody does that anymore, unless you go to like a nursing home <laughs> and, and you see the old ladies in their sewing circle. Exactly, and they're just sitting there waiting to hear back what happens. They they, they get back, and uh, there's a um, and uh, Ashley and um, Rhett. Rhett, Rhett Red, and Doctor Me, bro. Dr. That, that guy pulled it. Pulled his. Pulled yeah, his yeah. They, they both. They they all come back, and Ashley is basically drunk or acting drunk. Uh, and whenever the union, when the union officers come in and basically want to arrest all three of them, they were like, uh, "Oh no, no, no! We weren't. Uh, we weren't raiding anybody. We were out just out We were at drunk. Bell's. We were, and then we and were then, at Bell's. Yeah, again, the Mel's comes up again. The uh, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 whorehouse. The whorehouse. Uh, and then and then that's when the union soldier is like, "Oh, oh, geez, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I I'll leave." You know. And then as soon as he leaves, and they take off his jacket, and there he, there's Ashley bleeding all over the place. So oh, I love how he talks to the general, bro. He goes like, "You know, now the you know because of, uh, of this, now these men are not going to be on speaking terms with their wives. <laughs> you know, so why, why would we lie about that?" And he's like, "Oh, I, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm so you know." Like he still feels so bad that he accused them though, and then he le- and then he leaves with this with this other uh, soldiers, and then that's when you find out it's all a ruse. Like then you see Doctor Mead like acting all normal, and Mrs. Mead is like, you know, like what, what are you doing? You know, like they, they they all think he's drunk, when actually like they were just trying to fool the soldiers. That's a great scene, bro. Yeah, it's a great scene, and um, it's. Uh, yeah, but you find funny. out Ashley Ashley's wounded. Actually, yeah, you find out Ashley's so. wounded, and you find out Frank is dead. But it's so it's, it's interesting because right before that you were laughing, and then you find out right after that, and you know people are dead, and there's consequences. Uh, and yeah, it, yeah, and, and, I, and I love that scene also because you know they uh, they, they you know Doctor Mead and everybody take Ashley like to the bedroom to kind of help him heal, like you know to bandage his wound or whatever. And of course, you know, Scarlett's like, "Oh, Ashley, is he gonna be okay?" or, or whatever. And then Rhett's just standing there, like, like uh, Alpha, bro. And it's like, I guess you don't want to know what you become of your Mister Kennedy, you know? <laughs> like, she's worried about Ashley. She's not even asking about her damn husband. Like, man, <laughs> you know? Oh, whatever, bro. <laughs> that, that's me going on a mini rant right there. So shortly after his funeral. Uh, Brett basically proposes to Scarlett, and she goes, "Okay." <laughs> and we, <laughs> and we kind of fast forward uh, a little bit, and they have a daughter, and um, Scarlett basically, basically because she doesn't want to ruin her figure, she's like, "That's it, no more, no more children," because I, I don't want to ruin my figure, and I still want to, I still want to. Such BS, bro. bro. That that's really you know, that's, because that's she wants because she, she she thinks it'll like. You know, uh, uh, she thinks she'll get a better shot with um, with <laughs> Ashley if she if she has a better figure. You know, what a right. horrible horrible human being. <laughs> now, now, for those who don't know, also in the book, she actually has like two kids at at this point before Bonnie comes along. She has a kid with uh, Charles, which I find hard to believe, and with with Frank. So by this point in the novel, when Bonnie's born, she already has two other kids with two other men. So. 
Interesting that, that they left that out of the movie. I guess just to make kind of things kind of simpler. Yeah. Oh, and actually, one thing we didn't I didn't mention. I kind of wanted to. So I I went to a um over the uh, over the um, over the summer. Uh, I took kind of this this little uh, day trip out to a, a suburb here in Illinois with my wife, um, and we kind of it was just a very small little town where we just kind of spent the day and, and did some little activities. We went went to like a whiskey uh, uh, a whiskey factory things like that. It went to this like old house that was like you could tour, you know, you get to have take tours of this, like this old historical house, and we went to this room that they called the Gone with the Wind room. And the reason they called huh. it that is they had a lot of Gone with the Wind memorabilia there. Now, this is in Illinois, mind you. So there's no, like, historical ties to Gone with the Wind in Illinois. But um, so it, it, they had a lot of Gone with the Wind memorabilia in the room. So I was, I was thinking, like, why is there a Gone with the Wind room in this house? It's so weird. Um, and then, they just, they, then they revealed why is that the curtains, the green curtains on the wall, they claim, they claim, are the original curtains used in the production of the of Gone with the Wind before she made her before she made the dress, so I just would like to say that I was in the presence of those curtains. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they actually are legitimately the curtains or not, but that's what this house claims. So. I'll do some research into that later because that's interesting. If that's what those curtains ended up, that that's pretty cool. Yeah, but anyway, I just wanted to, I, I forgot to mention that earlier. We were talking about that dress, so, um, so, uh. So now that um, God damn it, I'm sorry. I gotta cough again. It's all right. I'm putting you. I'm putting myself on mute, so I'm not doing it in your ear. Okay. All right, I'm back. <clears throat> All right. So, at this point the war is over. Ashley is back. Uh obviously Red is back and uh they're kind of rebuilding their lives in the south. At yes. one point Ashley who did not really want to work uh with Scarlet be- because of all the kind of romantic uh and sexual tension that they had between them ends up working for Scarlet basically at Melanie's behest. Uh, because Melanie is the complete opposite of Scarlet. She's the most selfless person in the movie uh, and sees that her sister-in-law is in trouble and she needs Ashley's help and urges her husband to help her. Um, I still don't know if... I mean, did you ever get the sense that that, that Melanie uh, knows about the, the, the two of them? I mean, so there's a point that I'm about to get to uh, where they're at Ashley's party or Ashley's birthday party. Uh, and it basically comes out that, that they like each other and Melanie still stands up for her sister-in-law. Mm-hmm. But up until that point, do you think that Melanie knows? Honestly, I do. I really do. Um, and when that thing you're talking about the party, like she, she also mentions that, uh, her sister-in-law, India, who was prob- most likely the one that told her about what happened between Ashley and Scarlett at the at the mill. Um, she said, oh, she unfortunately she couldn't be here. So the way that's kind of framed is like, okay, India tells her what's going on. And instead of being mad at Scarlett, she kicks India out because she thinks she's lying to her. But I think deep down she knows. She knows. But because Melanie's the way she is, she can't – She. I don't think there there was ever like as the character. I I can't even imagine there's any part of her that would just hate anything. You know, even when she was talking about the Yankees, like you know she she didn't like the Yankees obviously, but it's like she she never hated them. You know, They're like she never hated anybody. So I'm sure she knew about all of that, but because of the way she is, she just couldn't bring herself to to hate, especially considering when she remembers the stuff. The good stuff that Scarlet has done for her, right? Well, it's it, it's interesting. It's it, it's interesting that how she's portrayed as as basically this very selfless figure, and it, even even as as you alluded to, it, you know, after 
hearing after India spreads these rumors, and you know it basically comes out at this birthday party. Melanie kind of stands by Scarlet's side and kind of basically lets everyone know that hey, she's my sister in law. She does not. She's not doing anything inappropriate, and you know. You guys can all f yourselves basically she yeah, um and, in the nicest way possible um absolutely and how about that dress on scarlet bro <laughs> <laughs> wow that's probably her best dress this is a family in, in, show in the... my friend <laughs> <laughs> that was probably her bet her, her her hottest dress bro, in the entire movie <laughs> and it's so funny bro when uh when uh so she's trying to hide from the from Rhett, like she's like, oh, I'm, I don't feel, I don't want to go to the party anymore. So he basically forces her to go. He's like, you know, you have to face the town now after what you know everybody's heard about you. And when he sits there at the at the mirror, like to start putting her makeup, he goes like, make sure you put on plenty of rouge so that you fit your character. So- <laughs> like, Rhett, bro, like what a, what an alpha. <laughs> That's a great line right there. Um. So at this point, we get one of the most uh, controversial scenes of the movie, when uh, after after this party and Scarlet comes home and, and and they have a little bit of a confrontation where Rhett is drunk. Uh, you get one, it's it's a controversial scene, but also one of the most famous scenes because when you see it's funny because when you see trailers and retrospectives and uh, 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 you know tributes or whatever to this film and, and clip shows and things like that, you always see the scene where he like carries her up the stairs and like in, in, in completely out of way. context and it's you hilarious know, out of context it's this romantic moment right in context he's forcing himself on her and he's like i'm gonna have sex with you tonight whether you like it or not and goes upstairs and commits marital rape i mean that's what he does what's interesting is uh, obviously in in, in 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 this day and age there's a lot of uh feminist critics that 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 call this for what it is it's marital rape and say that it's it's wrong it's inappropriate and this and that but the people who love this film including women and it's actually probably mostly women defend the film and defend the scene and they're totally okay with it and it, and, it, and i find that kind of fascinating even though I know you've been faithful to me all along. How do I know? Because I know Ashley Wilkes and his honorable breed. That gentleman. That's more than I can say for you or for me. We're not gentlemen. And we have no honor, have we? It's not that easy, Scarlet. Turn me out while you chase Ashley Wilkes, while you dream of Ashley Wilkes. This is one night you're not turning me out. It really. Uh it's uh it, it's interesting because when i when I watched the scene when I when I had my my latest screening prepared for the show, you know, I, I watched the scene and I'm like that's messed up. That's really messed up. But immediately, Scarlett's waking up and she's like, she has that glow on her. Like she's had just the time of her life. And it's like, okay, so are they justifying marital rape here because she liked it? Um, what are they going for? So it, it was a little hard to digest watching it in 2016. But. You know, at the time, I'm sure it, it didn't cause half the uh, the ruckus that it, that it, it that it does now. But you know, watching that that scene where he carries her up, and then watching the the scene immediately after that where she's all happy, it's like, okay, what are they are what are they trying to say here? It's so comical. You know? It's so comical yeah. the way the way she is. Like she's afterwards. singing, she's brushing her hair. It's like, damn. And I believe that's he, he, he gave it to her good, and and I believe that's that is whenever she, um, I believe that is whenever he offers to to divorce her, and she's like, and she says no, but not because she she loves him, but because she's like, well, it would look bad, so I don't want to do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but he's kind of sick of her though, and he's like, I'm just gonna take our child. And just... I, I, it's it's already three and a half hours. I'm already I've been sick of her. You know, <laughs> it took Red three and a half hours. <laughs> He's sick of her, and he just wants to go. He wants to go away. He he he, he takes his daughter with him, and then when he comes, he, I think they go to London. When he comes back, 
uh, and when he comes back, he um, oh, it's funny. I have the movie on in the background while we're doing this uh, the show, and I just got to the scene at the birthday party where she's wearing that dress. Um, told I mean, you, bro. I told you. I mean, it's a great dress, but you know what? What else is interesting is that boy, the the there's no subtlety here. She is wearing <laughs> she is wearing bright devil red in the scene. <laughs> It's like, wow, come on, filmmakers. Excuse me. Sorry, let me redo that because I just hiccuped in the middle of that. Okay. Mm. I mean, there is no subtlety here. She's wearing bright devil red. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, filmmakers. Uh, anyway. Give us a little credit to figure it out. <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amusing. Um, so finally, she, he, he comes back and she informs him he's pregnant, that she is pregnant. Uh, but they get into a fight. She falls down some stairs and she suffers a miscarriage. It seems like that point, like that's the that's one point in the movie that I seem seems a little out of place. Like it's kind of why is that there? Because I, I, I feel like it's not really needed. I'm inclined to agree with you, only because when I mean, the you have long this, enough, right? <laughs> so. Exactly, but when you have the scene after that with Bonnie, it's like you know. That that's that's the bigger tragedy in my opinion with Bonnie. So to have this because it's after what happens to Bonnie, that's when like it their their marriage is irreparable. Like Bonnie was the glue holding it together. Once she dies, it's over. Like there's no according to Red at least, there's no way he can stay with Scarlet now. Like that was Bonnie was there. Once once she was gone, he had no reason to stay. So but then say with, with this miscarriage, it's kind of, it almost seems like it's it's it, repetitive you know like okay she had a miscarriage and Rhett feels guilty because he, he feels it was his fault that she fell and all that but and he, and then after that he kind of wants to like make it up to Scarlet like you know I'm gonna make this work you know even if it's Rabani I'm gonna make this work you know but it, it, it feels repetitive because you know you have her have the miscarriage and then when you when you lose Bonnie you know it's like similar tragedies but I, 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 now that I'm thinking about it, I guess I can kind of see it because the miscarriage makes him want to try to stay with Scarlet. Once Bonnie dies, that's when he's like, I'm done. So That's true. I guess that makes sense. I guess that does make sense. But the, he's not quite done yet because we have to have, shove one more tragedy into the film. Yep. And uh, Melanie, uh, almost I think pretty much right after that, Melanie, who I think is pregnant, uh, she has some complications and she's on her deathbed. And... Uh, everyone rushes over to 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 their to their house. Yeah, she got pregnant again. I think that's what it was, yeah. and because she was so old, like she like the like Red told her, like you you can't do it. You know, you're you're too old. But you know, she said she's gonna try, and he's like, you know, you know, God bless you, and whatever he said to her. But then she now she has complications, and like you said, she's on her deathbed. Yeah, so she's on her deathbed, um, and she eventually dies. Uh, and we find out that you know through her death. And though, and how it affected Ashley, that Ashley, even though he's been he he lo- he did have feelings for Scarlett, uh, he never really truly loved her like he loved Melanie. So Melanie was his true love, mm-hmm. and now that Scarlett realizes that, she's like, oh, well, I'm not gonna get Ashley then. Maybe I should stick with this Brett guy, <laughs> and she runs home. To like to have this romantic reunion with Rhett, and Rhett's packing to leave. He's done. He's like, he, as you said earlier, he's done. He's packing for good. He's he's over. He just no chance of reconciliation, and it's done. And this yeah, is when what, you like when you have Bonnie, and then right immediately after that you have Melanie dying. It's like the, the the two things that were holding him together to give Scarlett a chance are now dead and buried. So it's like. The, why subject himself to this anymore? And the thing with, with Bonnie too, like we kind of like kind of glossed over it, but that's a that's the worst scene of the movie in, in my opinion because you know just to see, the way throughout the film Rhett would spoil her because he, this is what he would want to do with Scarlet. He wanted to spoil Scarlet, but when she became distant, he kind of projected all that onto his daughter. He spoiled his daughter rotten. You know, he like he took her on to London, he took her to Paris, he he bought her ponies. You know, he showed her how to ride. You know, and then when when she has that accident and and she breaks her neck, falling off the horse and dies, it's like, like it it, it really pulls on the heartstrings, probably more than any other scene in the movie, in my opinion. 
And then when you when you hear Mammy talking about like you know after like the doctor said you know she was sick, he got up, got his gun, and shot the pony. And it's like oh now the pony had to die too. It's like damn, <laughs> like this this really sucks. I feel really bad right now. <laughs> like it's, know, it's really like it's a it's a tough scene. This is the first time I've seen this film since I've had a daughter. And I've noticed ever since I, I we did a show about it where like uh, we did another show on Force Perspective where um, I talked about how anytime like a child is in danger I get a little more caught up in it than I than, than I would otherwise right uh, yeah. and and it came out in the most unlikeliest of movies in San Andreas where the Rock <laughs> where freaking the Rock is 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 trying to find his daughter amongst the the earthquake rubble <laughs> and his daughter's yeah. like twenty years old I remember that <laughs> and it's it's a it's a terrible I mean it's a I mean it's it's actually kind of a fun movie, but it's still a terrible movie. It's not a very good movie. It's not a Gone with the Wind level. Uh, yeah. But even in the movie like that, I get a little like nervous about the. Oh, the, 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 this the must have had you. You probably want to slit your wrist here. Yeah. So, but this film, <laughs> this film, like after this is the first time I've seen the film after having a daughter, and like I'm I'm there with Rhett. I am there with Rhett. If something happened to my daughter, that'd be it for me. I I would not. I would be just. I'm not saying I would divorce my wife and leave her, but I'm because but, because that we're, we don't have that relationship that Scarlet and Red have. But right. uh, I would pretty much, you know, be in that kind of the depression that that. Represents. But would you have shot the pony though? I may have, <laughs> <laughs> and I love animals, but I may. Have. <laughs> uh, anyway, so now, um, so now we have uh, uh, the the end of the film. Red is leaving. And there's nothing really that she, she can do to stop him. But she really – she begs and pleads with him, at, trying to get him to stay. And it's really only because she doesn't want to be alone. She doesn't want him to leave. She, it, it has nothing to do with the fact that she really actually loves him. It's just that, in in my opinion, she's just like, well, I can't have Ashley. I may as well keep this threat guy around. And <laughs> finally, Rhett just kind of says no. And in the most famous line of the movie, uh, and you alluded to it earlier, she's like – where will I go? What will I do? And he just looks at her and delivers. And, you know, even, you know, 77 years later, it's still such a frankly, uh, frankly, uh, that was actually not intended. Uh, frankly, <laughs> such a great line delivery where he goes, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Oh, damn. And he just walks off. And that's such a great, I mean, it is an iconic moment and it deserves, I had never had any context for that scene whenever I was, before I'd seen this movie. I was like, I never knew why he said it. I don't know. I didn't care. But when I see it and after you've been through like, three and a half, four, almost four hours of, of this relationship, and he finally says that to her, it's it's kind of satisfying. When he oh, yeah. It. Oh, man. Such a manly scene, bro. Like, that, like, that, like, kind of, when, he's tell, when he basically tells her off saying, I don't give a damn, that, that's like that's that's one of those moments where like you get up off the chair and you clap like yeah take that take that you know that's what you get you know and you know if this was made in 2016 it's the f word right or the s word at the end instead of damn so which has a more kind of stinging effect in my opinion but damn works damn, for 1939 damn, damn damn is what I, I don't, even if it was made now I'd still want damn damn is, is perfect damn is absolutely perfect for that. Uh, because I don't think people would say that we would even speak like that in the 1800s anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so damn, I think it works. Um, and then the film ends with her basically trying to find some sort of solace and trying to find, and you know, basically in her own sort of character um, character arc, she she looks inside herself. She's like, you know, I've been through so much over these last several years, and I've gotten through it. And she, you know, she delivers the last fine, the last line of the film where she's like, "And tomorrow is another day." So that's how the film ends. Not a happy ending. Two people are dead. Uh, one a child. Uh, the the relationship falls Bro, apart. Bro, there's like thousands of people dead. At the no, end I mean of, uh, of the main of the main <laughs> character. I mean, uh, 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 like her her uh, you know her sister in law is dead. Her 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 child is dead. Uh, her her husband has just walked out on her and everything and and this is how it ends and it's such a it's 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 amazing to me that it ends this way because this is the this is classic Hollywood where almost every movie had a happy ending and we end like this we end with a kind of a downbeat ending uh, that tries to have an up note where she's like tomorrow is another day but it's still it's a down ending uh, and. And I find that kind of amazing that they did that back in the 30s. Because in the in the 30s and 40s, whenever adapting books for uh, for film, 
Hollywood would, I mean, they do it now, but they yeah. would change things to make it more marketable or more cinematic, even changing endings to make them seem more uh, upbeat and happy. So uh, it, 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 I, it's funny that they didn't. I don't. Again, I don't know how the book ended. I, I would imagine that's how it, that's how the book. Okay. And that's I was about to say. Okay. That's the thing about this movie. Um, they really wanted to stay as faithful to the book as possible. So, I mean, when you really look at it, if you've read the book and you watch the movie, it's for the most part. I mean, yes, there's little things here that they changed, there's little things that they took out, but I would say ninety like percent of the book is in the movie. So. And and that was a Selznick thing too. Like he really wanted to stay as faithful to the book as he possibly could, which is why it ends like that. And I and you know, and like you said, it, like today or even back then, like they would change stuff just to make things more upbeat for people. You know, they like you know maybe nowadays you don't see it as much, but back then like everything had to be like a happy ending. But the fact that they left it like this is more a testament to him wanting to do the book good. Than to kind of be have the Hollywood ending. So that that's gone with the wind. That's the that's the end of the film. Um, well, hey, well, it, it felt like four hours. Yeah, <laughs> going through this. Yeah. So um, and we and we really just did highlights of the film. Uh, yeah. So a couple couple of uh, interesting notes that I want to want to talk about, and you can talk about anything that you think of. Uh, Hattie McDaniel, who played Mammy, like, as I mentioned before, was the first African American. Not just woman or man, but period, African-American, period, in any sort of role, whether it's acting, directing, writing, anything. First African-American, period, to win an Oscar. So she made history with that. Um, but while while she did make history doing that, it's still, um, it's still such a sign of the times because the film premiered – I mean this is back – I mean nowadays films premiere – films premiere in like – you know Hollywood, right? They have their their major premieres are in Hollywood, but here the film premiered in Atlanta. It makes sense because the movie's mm-hmm. you know based in in the South. Uh, in the South, obviously, in 1939, was still very much segregated, and Hetty McDaniel was not actually allowed to attend the premiere because she was black, and um, which is kind of insane. And Clark Gable, who was friends with her, uh, basically said. Uh, he would not attend the premiere unless she was allowed to go. Oh, he eventually did attend because Hattie McDaniel convinced him to do it. Yeah, I, um, I heard about that. So, like the story of that Atlanta premiere is interesting too. Like you said, you know, premieres are done in Hollywood, in L.A. They're done in New York, but like the fact that they went to Atlanta to premiere this was such a huge deal. Not just for like the industry insiders and all that, but for the people of Atlanta. This was huge for them. Like this was like I remember hearing about how essentially, you know, for for the three days that like Selznick was there and Gable was there and Vivian Lee was there, what that the three days that every all all the cast was there, um, that's all the newspapers talked about. You'd think nothing else happened in the world, as they said, you know, in those three days, because all they talked about in the Atlanta Constitution was Clark Gable's here. We're about, you know, gone with the wind this year. And, you know, it's, 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 to me, it's kind of a culture shock only because, like, I can't imagine, like, a city being that excited. Like, you know, if, if, let's say, uh, um, the next Star Wars movie premiered in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, I, I still don't think it would be, you know, that, like, that big of a deal in Omaha, Nebraska. Not because, you know, it isn't, but because like it's just it's just a different time. You know, like they get the with social media and the internet, like it's you know stuff like this isn't as big a deal anymore. But in 1939 with Atlanta, you know they had a ticker tape parade for them on the way to the theater. Like it, it was insane. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is kind of it is kind of a a. a, a you think they just come back beating Hitler, you know? <laughs> you think Clark Gable, like literally with his bare hands, just beat Hitler with the way they were receiving him? <laughs> but yeah, um, still, so Annie McDaniel not allowed to appear at that premiere. It's so, it's Which so- is really, yeah. But I mean, again, as you, like you said as well, sign of the times, I and mean, that's very, very unfortunate that that happened. But I mean, you know, it's just that that's how it was in the in the South. You know, it sucks. Um, also interesting that this 
it, it you know the Oscars had been going on for about uh, ten or eleven years at this point. Yeah, uh, this was the first film shot in color to win an Oscar. Uh, even though uh, Technicolor had been around for a while, uh, I know. And if you look at the poster, it says Metro Color, but it was Technicolor. Um, it was shot in Technicolor. Uh, it had been around for a while. This is the first time a movie. Uh, it's still the long. First of all, it's the longest movie to ever win Best Picture, um, and but it's also the first movie to win uh, the the Oscar that was shot in color, which I think is kind of an interesting little fact. Yeah, definitely. Didn't they want to do like a, now, I mean, this is just me like remembering a book that I once read about the Oscars. Isn't it true that they wanted to do like, I think at the time they wanted to do separate best pictures, like for one for black and white, one for color. Um, I think that was an idea that they wanted. I don't know if they ever did it, but I think that was an idea that they had planned on doing, but I guess it never got off the ground. I know for cinematography, they did have separate ones, but um, I don't think for best picture that ever happened. No, they never did. And they never did color and black and white pictures. But they this they they did do color and black and white cinematography. This, I wonder. I think this may have been the first year that they did color and cinema, uh, color and black and white cinematography. And they did. They actually also split up the other um, other uh, uh, categories. I think costume design and uh, art design were split into color and cinematography as well. And eventually, they they just combined them both into one thing. Yeah. Um, so what was the last black and white movie like today? Like, wasn't it The Artist? Like, am I missing one? But The Artist is the mean... last one that won an Academy Award for uh, in black and white. In white. Um, before that, the last one that won was Schindler's List. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm sure there are other black and white movies that have been released since The Artist. That's the last one that won an Academy Award for Best Picture. Right. That I can think of. A film that you're not a fan of. I am not. Ironically, we'll, we'll get to this on Force Perspective, but La La Land is in the spirit of the artist, but I think it's a much better film. But you're gonna, you're definitely gonna get to see that, though. Yeah, I'm gonna see that. I'm gonna try to get to that at some point. But you'll see what I'm talking about. I think it's it's in the spirit of the artist, but I feel it's a much better film. But that's just me. Okay. Well, interesting. Um. So interestingly enough, uh, the film which has never uh, been shortened at all, like in any form, in home media or television, has never been shortened. It's only ever been uh, its its original length. If, if anything, it's been longer because sometimes they've put in a longer intermission or longer overture uh, or exit music, but it's never – they've never cut it for television or anything like that, which I find interesting. Um, and the international version is about like maybe a minute longer because uh, they have to preface it with the story about the Civil War because, of course, you know, in – India and Portugal and all these other countries that don't know American history, you have to tell them what the Civil War is. So they have a whole preface talking about what the Civil War was about, like kind of just as a prologue before they actually get even into the overture. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and the what, what I also think is interesting is that there was very specific instructions on how the projectionists had to um, – had to project the film, which I think is now very... that was discovered just recently. I think yeah. like in the last few years, somebody dug that up. Yeah, and and you can um you can find it online. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you guys, but uh, I was just gonna give you a little sample here. I found that uh, you can't find it online. Um, uh, if you just if you just Google "Gone with the Wind" projection instructions, you can you can find it. For example, real one, real one of "Gone with the Wind" begins with a two minute and thirty one second musical overture preceding the main title. During the last thirty seconds of this overture, it is urged that the house lights be gradually dimmed so that all lights in the auditorium will be fully out at the end of this overture. <laughs> uh, intermission. There's a silent title reading intermission running for ten feet, which comes in reel six of the two thousand foot reels. Then reel six B in those rare cases where one thousand foot reels are still being used. This is followed by approximately 30 seconds of silent black leader. This in turn is followed by approximately four minutes of uh, and eight seconds of music on the soundtrack, also accompanied by black leader. <laughs> uh, huh. it's, um, at the end here, let's see. Uh, after the end title in real 13, there are 13 seconds of silence and black leader, followed by four minutes and 15 seconds of exit music. The house lights will be presumably be gradually turned up following the end title, but because of color effect of the last shot, it is requested that house lights should not be turned up until immediately after the end title so um i mean there's a lot more of this you, you, again you can find it on online any 
anywhere. Um, but it is just very interesting how specific they were about the projection. And and, and I love how wacky like they they put exit music like literally after the last shot it was like black for like four seconds. And then you have exit music and it's like four minutes of exit music. And it's like that's that's pretty awesome. I was like I don't think a film since them has had exit music like that. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Ben Hur had, and I can't remember. Well, I'm but. trying to think of movies like you know. There's like 2001 and Ben Hur and Lawrence of Arabia. They all have overtures and intermissions. Right. I don't. But think as they, exit I don't music, know about exit music. I have. To, I don't think about. I, I don't know about exit music. I don't think that they might not. They might not. That's interesting. Tarantino should have added it to Hateful Eight. <laughs> the, the exit music that would have been. Should wacky. have. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. He should have. For the um, seventy millimeters. So interesting, interesting bit of uh, uh, of trivia about the film is that so in the nineteen fifties when television came about, um, movie studios uh, were pretty quick to kind of sell off movie rights and license movie rights to different networks mm. um, of of old movies that were just sitting around not doing anything because it was a way to make money and it was a way for television studios to get content. But for some reason, and some people have kind of posited that the reason being that uh, Gone with the Wind was so popular, they could always you know, re-release it in theaters and make money it, off and, it. And make money, yeah. Uh, they never idea. did it with Gone with the Wind until 1976, so almost 40 years after the film came out. It was the it, it aired on television for the first time on HBO, uh, of all places. In all 19, right. I didn't even realize HBO was around in 1976, but apparently it was. Um and uh, it played, let's see here, uh, played on the channel for a total of 14 times throughout the rest of the month. Uh, it went on network television after uh, uh, NBC paid uh, several million dollars for a one-time airing. And then, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through the entire history, but eventually uh, in the 80s when Turner bought the MGM Film Library. Billionaire Ted, yep. bro. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever they bought the film library in nineteen in the nineteen eighties, uh, they've basically owned the movie uh, the broadcast rights ever since then, and basically run it on their channels all the time on Turner Classic Movies, uh, sometimes on TBS, but for the most part, uh, you only ever see it on on TCM at this point. Yeah, a good old billionaire Ted, who I hear is a frequent guest on the Keith Fabulous Sushi Brothers. So, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've never, you know, I, I'm not sure if I tell you this, but I recently got rid of cable because I never watch it anymore, and I'm, I'm just using, I'm just watching over the air channels, and um, the only thing I miss is Turner Classic Movies. That's the only channel I miss. Well, if you stick with Filmstruck, then you got your fix right there. <laughs> Um, but you know, once once they, I I, I, I could get the, I could get it on Filmstruck. That's true. Uh, but it's mostly if you've seen it on Filmstruck, I think it's mostly like Criterion art films and stuff. It's not a lot of not a lot of classic stuff. It's mostly, mm-hmm. I mean, classic art. Well, films. I mean, they're probably gonna ease that in little by little. Yeah. You know, like I know, like, like Turner Classics. Like I, they just just last weekend there was it's an old documentary, but they had one on called I think they had a series called Night at the Movies or something like that. Mm-hmm. And like every episode is like a different theme. So like this one was Christmas films. So you had It's a Wonderful Life, um, uh, like the, the Bishop's Wife. I like to talk about those. Um, they even went into like Home Alone, Gremlins. They talked about those movies. They, they mentioned they mentioned Fred Claus too very briefly, which I found very interesting. Ugh, I don't know why Claus. you would talk about that, but um, <laughs> but like um, uh, Meet Me in St. Louis. You know, they talked about all those movies, and they said, "Oh, we're going to be showing all these movies throughout the month on Turner Classics." I'm like, yes. So, <laughs> I'm looking forward to filling my DVR up with a lot of these classics. So, speaking of Turner, so not only did it, um, not only did the once they once they bought the film, uh, but they used the film to launch both TNT and Turner Classic movies, which I think is interesting. Um, and it's pretty much been available in different home video formats ever since then. So, uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, uh, very rare life on television and only on television and on, on Turner own networks. Um, so after the film, uh, a sequel was thought about uh, called uh, – and, and a, a manuscript was written – uh, and it was 775 pages, and I wonder if that's sitting anywhere because I'm sure someone could publish it and like make money off of it. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised no one has. But a 775 manuscript. It was called. I mean, sp- I mean, this is a mouthful of a name. Terra 
the continuation of Gone with the Wind. <laughs> uh, and it was supposed to take place um, after she uh, Scarlet gets divorced from uh, gets divorced from Rhett, um, and is focused on a period of time after that. But MGM, for whatever reason, never liked the story, and then the, it just never happened. I mean, it, it's this would never happen in 2016 again. If this if that movie made as much money as it did. The studio would do everything in its power. They commissioned four sequels, bro. They they would do everything in its power to make sure a sequel happened. Um, so it, it's fun. It's interesting that never one never came of it. Although that said, I wouldn't be surprised if some at some point someone tries to remake it because it probably will. Oh, let's not stop thinking about that. Uh, but and you know they they will replace "damn" with the F word. I'll tell you that right now. If that happens, so. a, a sequel was made for television called Scarlet. Uh, in the 90s, and uh, I don't know who the actress who played Scarlett O'Hara was, but I do know that former failed Bond, uh, James Bond, uh, <laughs> Timothy Dalton Bond. played, played uh, Rhett Butler. Although and, I will uh, say... And, and sh- bro, Sean Bean is in that movie. I, uh, is he? And he doesn't die. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> that's one of those actually... rare films. Um. <laughs> uh, so Timothy, I you know Timothy Dalton, like, and it's fun. It's 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 fun to make fun of him, but honestly, he's he's he 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 put in two decent Bond movies, the uh, Living Daylights and uh, License to Kill are all, are both pretty good, despite the fact that he was a boring Bond. They're both pretty good movies. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> the failed Bond, bro. So do you have uh do you have any um any other kind of tidbits on on Gone with the Wind before we move uh, on? Uh, no. Not, not really. Not as far as trivia. I think we pretty much covered everything I wanted to say because um, I, de- I definitely wanted to talk about the the search for Scarlet. And that's that's probably my my favorite part of the whole behind the scenes of the film. You know, talking about the uh, the burning of Atlanta. That's also a favorite tidbit of mine. Um, yeah, well, we pretty much covered everything I wanted to talk about. So okay, yeah, yes. <laughs> so um, you can watch uh, Gone with the Wind on most uh streaming platforms you can digitally rent or purchase it on amazon itunes or youtube um it is not available streaming on netflix but you can rent the disc through netflix and it is uh pretty widely available in dvd and blu-ray uh to uh, to to actually buy and own uh i actually have the blue the 70th anniversary blue- the bare bones edition there's no um there is no special features on it so i know that there's a very big like box set that you can get I don't have that one. I just have the There's bare two. bones. Oh, there is? The one is out of print now, which is the 70th anniversary. Okay. Um, and then two years ago was the 75th anniversary, so they uh, did a new box set for that. And I actually have the uh, the Diamond Lux uh, box. It's not it's not the big box, but it's just a regular um, kind of a digipack Blu-ray box for the 75th anniversary, which um, only has two discs. It has the movie on one, and then the second is a Blu-ray that has – the two new uh, special features that were made for the 75th anniversary. So the special features from the 70th anniversary are missing from the Diamond Lux um, set, but it's they're in the box set, like the big box set. So that's kind uh, of disappointing. So I actually have to go and uh, uh, kindly borrow the 70, 70th anniversary disc from my mother so I could watch like the uh, other uh, documentaries like The Making of a Legend, um, the... Uh, the Scarlett O'Hara Award with TV film, which is on there with Tony Curtis as Selznick, which is pretty awesome, actually. It's wacky. So, um, yeah, that yeah, that set is filled with good stuff. Um, but I'm disappointed that the Diamond Lux that they released two years ago doesn't have that extra disc. So I had to actually go kindly borrow it. But it's still a – it's still a, the, the, the Diamond Lux series, I think that that series kind of fell flat. Like nobody was really interested in them. Like even though the, the, the digipacks are kind of cool, but – I mean, it was it was nothing special. So I, I think they stopped making them already. Only a few films were in that that list. Interesting. Um, I yeah, I, I just bought the bare bones one. I might buy go go back and buy one of the big big editions, but I'm not sure yet. And I'm sure in three years from now, when the 80th anniversary comes around, they might release another big box set. There you go. Um, I have some re- uh, as far as recommendations. If you like Gone with the Wind. I have a couple of recommendations you should like. Uh, you should watch. Uh, first, as far as big romantic sweeping dramas, I would recommend if you like *Gone with the Wind*, you would like my favorite film of all time, *Casablanca*. *Casablanca*, which is, which is a big historical romantic drama. Um, if you if you're into romantic epics, 
I would I would recommend two movies. Uh, one we already talked about. The other, uh, which is Titanic, it's a big historical romantic drama. Uh, big, also very well known for its uh, high production value. Um, and also, Doctor. Oh, Who- it's, not, it's not for something else, but that's crossing into Danny territory. Yeah. So. Uh, and then uh, Doctor Zhivago as well. Um, that's a good one. That's that is a great film. Uh, two Clark Gable movies I would recommend are It Happened One Night. One Night. Boom. Uh, which is a great Criterion version of. Uh, and Mutiny on the Bounty, which is also a really uh, good movie. And, uh, and a, a one Olivia de Havilland movie I would recommend is The Heiress, uh, which is uh, – I think it won her an Oscar for Best Actress. Um, and it's about this kind of uh, dumpy heiress that, that kind of attracts a, a young man and then – well, I'm not going to give it away, but it's it's very good. I, you should go out and watch it. Um, those are my picks for uh, a recommendation. Do you have any recommendations if you like Gone with the Wind? Uh, not particularly. I mean, you you had some good picks yourself. Although, like, if you're into epics, though, I do I do recommend Ben Hur. Like when I, when I think epics, I think Gone with the Wind, and I think Ben Hur. So, like, if you're if you're into like you know historical like long epic films, Ben Hur is another one you should you should give a shot to. Okay, and as we wrap up, I do before we get to our next movie, uh, I'm gonna just want to go through our, our, our little tradition here that we started uh, on this week in film history. I'm gonna go through some of the films, and there's gonna be one in here that you're gonna really appreciate. Uh, there, this is the this week in film, uh, and the week we're looking at is December as we record this, uh, December fourth to the eleventh. Uh, in, in this week in film, in 1920, the first Zorro movie, The Mark of Zorro, was released, which is a re- which is actually a really fun movie. If if you, if you can deal with silent films and 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 and, and the and no dialogue, The Mark of Zorro is really good. Uh, Cat People, which is a great Criterion release, uh, nice. it, it also came out this week. Uh, if you're in the mood for some Christmas movies, The Bishop's Wife with uh, Cary Grant was released this week. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Speaking of big historical dra- uh, epics. Uh, released 1962. Uh, one of the, and we're going to fast forward to the 70s uh, with Al Pacino, little Al Pacino, and Serpico was released in 1973. Nice. Also, I just bought that movie, actually. It's a great film. Great film. Also in the 70s, uh, 1978 this week, uh, The Deer Hunter uh, and Superman the Ooh. Movie, both released in the same week, uh, 1978. Uh, in 1982, uh, one of the great Paul Newman movies that no one ever talks about, uh, a movie that he should have won the Oscar for, The Verdict. You ever seen The Verdict? I have not seen The Verdict, but f- I've heard of it. It's, fin- it's a phenomenal film. He should have won the Oscar that year. I don't know who, who robbed him of it, but he should have won the Oscar that year. Uh, and in 1983, we have two films that came out this week. Uh, first is the the one the film that went on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture that week uh, that year, which was uh, Terms of Endearment. Uh, kind of, mm. kind of a. I've seen it. Yeah, it's very, it's a very chick flicky, very film. melodramatic, uh, very melodramatic, Oscar-y, Oscar bait kind of movie. But the other film, a very, at the extreme opposite, is a is a certain certain co-host's favorite film. <laughs> uh, Scarface. Scarface Face. was released this week in 1983. Oh yeah. Uh, in the 90s, we had uh, Edward Scissorhands in 1990. And A Few Good Men, You Can't Handle the Truth, in 92. And Good Will Hunting all came out this week, as well as The Green Mile in 99. And the most recent film uh, of this list that came out this week in history, Brokeback Mountain, premiered in 2005. So, all right. So uh, th- that's this week in movie history. And now we're going to get to our next film. We're not going to pull out the random movie generator. This is the second time I've done this on the in the history of the show. It, it, the first time was for our Halloween episode, which ended up being the film Halloween. Uh, this time it's going to be our Christmas episode. Uh, I felt like we needed to do this, and I actually we we talked about this on our very first episode that we were going to be doing this movie uh, because the random movie generator actually already picked this episode the first time we used it. Uh, this movie, the first time we used it, but I said we're going to save this one for Christmas, and that is it's a wonderful life. Damn right, we get to see Uncle Billy twice now in two episodes. <laughs> now, of course, it had to be "It's a Wonderful Life." How could we not do "It's a Wonderful Life" for Christmas? Of course, it had to be right. Of course, like what other film? I mean, I mean, sure, you're gonna throw "Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street" at me. You're gonna throw um, uh, "Meet Me in St. Louis." You're gonna throw me "Home Alone." You're gonna throw me, you know, all these other movies. I would throw it "You Jingle All the Way," but you'd probably repel it. 
No, um, I would have but, that movie with fire. <laughs> but, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, when he – this was the film, bro. This was the film that every year after the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on NBC, they would show this movie. At least was, this was growing up. Nowadays, they always show the dog, the damn dog show after the parade. But, you know, in my youthful years, every year after the parade, they would show It's a Wonderful Life on NBC. Like, every year. And that's how I grew. That's how I discovered it, and that's how a lot of people discovered it was through when it got into public domain and it was just shown on TV for free. You know, that's how it, it went from this like little known like box office failure, let's just put it bluntly, to now this must watch every year at Christmas classic. Uh, and, and we will get into all the complicated history of uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" and uh, and exactly why. Um, it became the classic it did, uh, much of the stuff that you were talking about there. It is legitimately one of my favorite movies, um, not just Christmas movies, per- movies, period. I would put it in my personal top ten. I really, really love that movie, and I am such a, I am such generally a cynic and, uh, you know, just grumpy jerk most of the time. Especially after November 8th. Uh, we're not gonna, we will not talk about that. <laughs> not talk about that. Um... <laughs> But this movie, actually, every year I watch it, it it does bring me hope and inspiration and and and, and goodwill, uh, and it is um, legitimately one of my favorite movies. So I can't wait to talk about it. And I am a very much uh, a, a, a huge fan of Jimmy uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, I read his biography, and I, I know a couple of things about him and, and, and this film, so I'm, I'm very excited to talk about it. So that will be our Christmas episode. Uh, hopefully it, won't, it will drop before Christmas. Uh, I'm not going to – I, I want to make sure we absolutely no, it will. before it will. Christmas. No, it will. So um, uh, be sure to be on the lookout for that. And then after that, we'll probably take a little bit of a break until after the new year. But for now, uh, look for, uh, hope you enjoyed Gone with the Wind, and look forward to It's a Wonderful Life. Um uh, so we're going to get to plugs before we head out of here. Uh, please visit EssentialFilmsPodcast.com where you will find uh, reviews and countdowns and all sorts of things uh, that will kind of maybe help your day at work go a little faster. You can email me at EssentialFilmsPodcast at gmail.com. And please like the Essential Films on Facebook and follow at Essential Films on Twitter. And also please set up a Patreon page for this uh, podcast um, to hopefully kind of Get some. And we're not looking to make a lot of money off of this show, but we are looking to maybe keep it uh, financially, get it financially supported, so that we can keep doing it for you, uh, for you folks, free of charge. So uh, if you want to head over to uh, the pa- Patreon and search for the Essential Films, and just give us a little bit of a, a hat, to, uh, a little bit of a tip to keep the lights on, that would be great. Um, but please also listen to our other show, Force Perspective. Uh, which you, you and I both do, uh, and uh, where we talk about more current films. Uh, we Our most recent episode, we talked about Doctor Strange, Arrival, uh, Edge of Seventeen, Fantastic Beasts, uh, and then the episode before that, I know we did The Girl on the Train, and Inferno, and Ouija, uh, which I still can't believe I liked. Uh, but please make sure you follow uh, Force Perspective as well. So uh, anything else you would like to uh, add? Um... You you pretty much covered it there, but I will say like if you know follow me on Twitter at SportsGuy515. You can follow um, the, the Force Perspective Show at FP Movie Pod. We're, we're not on it as often as we probably should be, but you know we do throw out a couple tweets here and there. So uh, give us a follow. Um, the uh, Force Perspective episode that Adolfo just kindly plugged right now is up right now at uh, Geekdom101.com. Um, Next episode of that will most likely be our big uh, Rogue One review. So uh, we're very excited about that release coming out. So uh, be sure to look out for that as well. So it's a wonderful life and Rogue One coming at you this month from us. So very exciting. Right. So we're very we're very excited about that Rogue One episode as we are for the movie. So we'll we hopefully uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you over there as well as as well as the next episode of uh, it's a uh, the essential films for it's a wonderful life. So that'll much do is for us. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed our show tonight, and uh, we hope that. Uh, well, I don't give a damn if you do, though. I'm just, I just want to let you know. I, I frankly don't give a damn if you enjoyed it or not. <laughs> well, I, I do give a damn, uh, and I hope that you listen to us for ne- our next episode. But until then, tomorrow is another day. Red, 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 you go. What shall I go? What shall I do? 
frankly, my dear, i don't give a damn.